Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 33. This is a very exciting one, ladies and gentlemen. We are here with, in the flesh, not even from some remote location, but actually here in our game room, Eric Roos, designer of Spirit Island. Also, Matt and Orion are here. Say hi. Hello. Hey. But more exciting, we got Eric here. <laughs> to talk to about one of our favorite games of recent memory. We love Spirit Island, and we have lots of questions of it. Thank you so much for coming out and willing, being willing to talk with us about this. Thanks very much for having me. Let's just jump into some questions then. Sure. Talk a little bit about you, talk a little bit about the game. Let's start with you. How did you get into modern board games? I always want to find out what was the entry point where you really got into the games we played today and say, hey, there's something really cool here. Uh, I guess you'd say I sort of got into the periphery of them a very long time ago through probably uh, Robo Rally, uh, some Looney Labs games by Andy Looney, uh, Ice House, and uh, Flux back in the day, and one or two others, which were sort of like, you know, out on, out, out on the borders, but then I sort of uh, jumped in a level into not just modern games, but modern Euro games, mm -hmm. and I found a copy of El Grande. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was, it was great. Now, I got it entirely because it was set in Spain. You just like Spain? No, it had to do with a role-playing game I was in. I was GMing at the time, and there was a character who always ended up in Spain without really meaning to be. Uh, so, and he was one of the people who I frequently played board games with. Uh, so this was, I don't know, you know, late nineties. Sure. Uh, and so I'm like, oh, Hey, here's a game. Like it looks interesting. I took a, you know, glance over the box. It looks like it has some interesting mechanics. It wasn't the first one I'd, I'd acquired. I think I'd gotten Nautilus before a year or two before. And I'm like, oh, and it's in Spain. Great. I can give him Spain for Christmas. Uh, and <laughs> then we can play the game. So I tried it. It was like, this is great. This is fantastic. You know, this is a really good game. And, you know, an order of magnitude more satisfying than sort of the entertaining experience games, which uh, some were maybe about half of what we played at the time, mm -hmm. uh, where it's a sort of fun romp, but you're not really much in control of what's going on. Sure. And so that was sort of the gateway. I found Board Game Geek sometime around then, started using it to read up on reviews, learn about games ahead of time, and uh, find everything else. Fun fact, they hate El Grande. Oh, really? That is neither fun nor <laughs> factual. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was really excited to show it to them. I pulled it out when we were at, was it PAX East? Yeah, we yeah we played it at PAX East. It was kind of at the end of just a long day, and we were happy to play something that someone knew. We I, I enjoyed it. Frustrated by some of the, the bidding and I not understanding what's what's happening. Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember at least twice you saying, "I hate this game." Yeah, but I say that about Dominant Species, and I love that yeah. game. <laughs> True. I hate this moment of pain in this game. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, they they don't hate it. They but they didn't but love it. That is interesting. Like that was one of your big games. I mean, I love it. I think it's a great game. Of that kind of classic, classic grouping of games like Catan and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to a couple people now who have pulled out El Grande. No, I, did, I didn't play Catan until years after playing El Grande, uh, and I think now to date I've only played Catan maybe eight or nine times, if that. Mm -hmm. Not so often, but. No, El Grande, I, I don't play it often these days, uh, because when I do, I kind of want to play it with the uh, Koenig and Intrigant expansion, which, which gives the the new bid cards, but those are only really good if you sort of know the game and have been playing it recently, so it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. I don't get it to the table often enough to use the pieces, which would make me want to get it to the table more often. Yeah, I would, I would have bought it, except I do think Dominant Species is a better kind of version of the same game. Mm -hmm. You played that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So El Grande is kind of your foray into yes. Euro gaming. What are you really enjoying right now? What's your, some of your favorite games currently? Some of my favorite games right now? Well, one I'm excited to get to the table is uh, Argent the Consortium, which I played a lot of over the last couple years. And then there was a, a, like a second edition or something with a, like a P an upgrade pack, which gave Errata, you know, had a, a couple of fixed cards for errata and little better plastic bases. And just reading through all the new stuff is like, oh, great. You know, I want to play this again. We actually uh, just spoke two weeks ago with, with Trey. Uh, 
Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, who designed that one? Yeah, yeah. I haven't got to play it yet. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's I, I've enjoyed that. I have played that one. I don't know, easily a dozen times before it came out because I saw very early prototypes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the ways in which I actually met Trey was uh, at Designer Alley at BGG Con. So you know, I was really looking forward to that one coming out. And when it finally did, played the heck out of it. I have this. I have one group with whom you know it becomes sort of the traditional game on our on our on our Sunday get-togethers. I don't think I've been focusing a lot on any specific game except for playtesting at this point mm-hmm. uh, i've been doing so much playtesting that that's sort of been the the default uh and beyond that it's just been sort of been a, a smorgasbord of sampling yeah yeah you know? we gotta play ours now like we talked to trey we have to <laughs> you're like the fourth person who's recommended it to me yeah. or who's been enthusiastic about it so you get into modern board games mm-hmm. at some point you're like okay i want to design a board game and then the first one you have published, at least according to BB, BGG, is called Fealty. Yes. Was that the first design you kind of really went for? Did you have a bunch of different designs at that point? So I've been designing board games of various quality since I was, I don't know, like seven. Uh, you know, when I took out the big piece of paper and drew a sort of standard roll and move with little things which happen on the spaces... And I'm not sure I've ever really stopped. Uh, sometimes instead of board games, it would be RPGs or computer games, but it's just sort of been ongoing. Uh, there was a shift at some point where I'm like, okay, I actually want to try and design games which then get published or which I publish or which somebody else publishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was that was actually, I think, even before playing El Grande, or if not, then not long after. Uh, I have been playing something else. I can't remember. It was one of those sort of small fly-by-night companies which put out a game where the theme was really entertaining, but the gameplay was so-so, and the rulebook looked great until you actually tried to play the game. And then you started like, you're like, oh, wait, what, what about this case? And you go and look it up, and it's totally ambiguous. And after finishing playing that once or twice, I'm like, you know, I can make something better than this. Uh, and people apparently want to buy and play this. So why don't I try that? Now, it's not actually that easy in practice, because even if you can build something better than that, how do people know about it? But uh, that's sort of what set me on the path and towards a sort of deliberate practice. Like, I want to get better at this so that I can not just have fun doing it in my spare time, but I can share the results with other people. That's always what I've enjoyed about sort of any sort of creation. It's the you know, when I... When I play tabletop RPGs, I'm usually game master because I like making things for people and then seeing them enjoy it. The first title which I sort of solicited for pitching was called Pioneers. Mm -hmm. Uh, That did not get picked up for reasons which in hindsight are excellent reasons. (laughs) Uh, it 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 was getting turned down with like, there's nothing wrong with this game. We can't really give you any criticism about it, but it just doesn't have enough to it to make it like stand out. Yeah. And in hindsight, it's like, yeah, okay, no, that's totally fair. There are a few designs which don't even have official titles where I sort of did them, polished them, went, okay, this is great. Is this pitch worthy? Ah, uh, I could, but I feel like I can do better. So let me try something else. Fealty, I didn't formally pitch, actually. I was playtesting it at a games day where Chris Sesluk of Osmati Games happened to be, and he saw it and he's like, that's kind of interesting. And then he saw it again later and was like, would you, I might be interested in publishing that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so that that one didn't go through the formal pitch process. Were you planning on pitching it at some point? It turned out well, yes, and it was turning out pretty well. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the version he first saw was this insanely rough one, which was, it had some of the end product's good bits, but it also had these terrible clunky bits which still needed to be fixed, so. And I don't know much about that game, I, I looked at kind of the pictures on BGG. It looks kind of abstract. It's a lightly themed abstract. Okay. Uh, it's a territory control game where the sort of the two primary conceits on it. One is that you're playing your pieces during the game and they're all grabbing territory around them, but they don't do so until the end of the game. And some pieces grab small amounts of territory, but are fast. They go first at the end of the game. Other pieces will grab vast swaths, but are slow, which means if the faster pieces are near them, they can block them off. So there's sort of a a tempo war going on the entire time, and it's not resolved until end game. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other bit is that there's a constraint where you can only play a a single piece in a given row and a single piece in a given column. So your options narrow dramatically. At the beginning, the board is wide open, and you can play virtually anywhere you want, but... 
between the row and the column constraint, and on a given turn, only one player can play on a given board. So by the you know by the last placement of the game, at the end of the the very last play of the game is made by somebody you you know the entire game state, so you can figure okay here are the great places to play, but you may not be able to play there because you may have painted yourself into a corner. Interesting, interesting. And then after that, you have kind of a, a break, and then all of a sudden we get Spirit Island, which. I think, I don't know the sales numbers or anything, but like it's in the top 100 now. It seems to be a pretty it's, big success for you. It's, it's yeah, it's going into its, I think they're going to order a sixth printing in this coming month. Yeah, which for the first year is a lot. Yeah, that's so, great. It's fantastic. I couldn't be happier. And with Spirit Island, it kind of has this nice high concept theme. Mm-hmm. It's the traditional kind of colonialist thing, except completely backwards where the colonialists are the evil guys and you're trying to ward them off. I assume that was the starting point for the game where you said, I wanted to do, I want to do that theme. Yes. And it went from there. Yeah. Usually when I, when I come up with a game idea, I'll, I'll have little fragmentary ideas, but games coalesce when I get any two of the following three things, a strong thematic feel, a interesting mechanic, which I want to work with and explore and a, vision of a play experience moment uh, which may not have any mechanical rootings but where I kind of like oh this is the sort of thing a person might be thinking about or this is how they might sort of feel with some sort of dynamic going on and when I get two of those which kind of mesh together they'll often sort of combine and uh, form via some internal mental chemistry a game idea. In this case it was that strong thematic idea combining Mm -hmm. with some mechanical ideas I've had for doing a co-op which was alpha resistant in ways which did not make it through to the end game, even though for other reasons the game proves a little bit alpha resistant. Um, oh, interesting. But the, the, initial, the initial mechanical concept involved something more like action programming, where you were playing your power cards face down instead of just slow and fast. There was a wide variety of speeds, and you couldn't communicate at all about what you were playing until you revealed it. Mm-hmm. And so it was sort of this, you know, cooperative blind action programming thing this was before space alert uh, was out so you know that comparison didn't occur to me um, right yeah but a little a little bit of robo rally oh yeah yeah little, then, absolutely yeah, yeah. no th- there's no question that robo rally had an influence there so that hidden action programming ended up not working with the game but that was sort of the starting point where i where i went from and so the theme stayed and got stronger but the mechanics then shifted to match and it's interesting because to me i think spirit island There's nothing specific that's anti-alpha player in the game, but just because there's so much going on, at least in our experience, Mm -hmm. it functionally ends up blocking alpha player because you're just spending so much time trying to figure out what you can do that you end up only asking your teammates, okay, what can you do here? Which is precisely what you want people to be asking each other in a co-op game. Yep. Uh, I, I view it as resistance rather than blocking, I and mean, it's not it's not immune to it by any stretch. But what it does is it gives. Uh, I saw somebody online actually who who uh, I think it was on Reddit or something said like you know you know I tend to be our group's alpha. I'm not a strong alpha player, but I'm a weak one. I'll tend to to meddle in other players' turns simply out of a desire for something to do. Spirit Island gives anybody like that who just sort of wants to be engaged all the time something for them to do. It gives them something else to think about so that they don't need to do that in order to stay engaged with the game. Was that something... Because once you go in and say, okay, I want to do a mechanical thing Mm -hmm. that blocks the alpha player problem, and that falls away, Mm -hmm. did that end up being kind of a happy accident along the way? Or did you still, after the, the programming part went away, did you still try to do something to stop the alpha player problem? I still tried to, I, I tried playing the game where, you know, you're down to like just fast powers and slow powers, but where, and you could discuss them, but you, you were playing your powers face down in order to sort of help avoid that. But that just proved to be a kind of a pain in the butt for the players. So I'm like, well, let's try it without, and the sky didn't fall. It still worked out fine. There wasn't a lot of alpha in practice, even though hmm. there was no formal communication restriction. So... It worked out okay, so I'm like, okay, we'll go with it. Like that's that, that's fine. It plays well. So yeah, I played it once with all new players, and I wasn't trying to be the alpha, but they all kept asking me like, what do I do here? What do I do here? Yeah. And then my one friend just like he just could not get his head around what the cards would do, and yeah. I'd have to constantly be like, 
no, that doesn't work like that. No, you can't play that there. And, and, and so on. So I ended up almost playing for everyone. And then we stopped after three rounds because it wasn't really fun at yeah, that no, point. That's not, that's not good. No, no, yeah. It's, I mean, you, it's, it's a heavy game. You got to... Yeah. The, uh, yeah, and somebody who knows it well enough can, in theory, play for other people, but it usually requires their active collaboration, like, I'm going to lean over and show you my cards, as opposed to, like, you know, no, no, stop, here, let me plan your turn for you. That's not impossible. You know, yeah, I guess the well cards enough, but... kind of provide a barrier, because in other games that do have an alpha problem, it's a lot of it's displayed on the board. Yep. And in this, the most important things are just in people's hands. Yeah. What, yeah. I, what, I, what I tend to see in cases of borderline alpha-ing is player, every player will pick their own cards and then somebody is saying, well, hey, you, you're blowing up a town there. What, why don't you do that over there instead? And that's kind of like barely over the line from healthy cooperation. So, you know. Yeah, that's not a, a bad worst case. Exactly. In terms of the design, what was the the hardest part for you? What was the biggest challenge to overcome in that process that's i'm gonna have to think about that for a second because the design was over the course of five years during which i had two kids like fealty between i came up with this idea with scrolls on paper and here are the files going to the printer was i think i don't know eight months nine months sure uh spirit island was much longer i posted a i don't even know like 22k designer diary on board game geek and that touches the highlights of maybe, I don't know, 10% of the design, it's, there was a lot. Because once I had kids, I pretty much dropped all but my two most advanced projects at the time. Uh, which is why you didn't see much from me, because my time became very constrained. I mean, uh, the, the, there's, if there's something to be more important than, than board games, I suppose family the, is a good one. <laughs> the, uh, my kids are now playing board games. It's great. Oh, that's the, awesome. Yeah. The hardest thing design-wise. The hardest thing in early design was raw content generation. All of my previous designs prior to Spirit Island had leaned heavily towards a very Euro direction, you know, very, you know, minimalist mechanics trying to go, you know, maybe not as, you know, as abstract as Fealty is, but always trying, you know, whenever there was a conflict between sort of thematic elements and elegance of mechanics, then generally I would defer to the mechanical simplicity. The result of that is that in general, I didn't end up having games, if there were a lot of, you know, if there were special powers or something, there wouldn't be that many of them. They wouldn't be too strongly asymmetrical or everybody would have equal shot at them. There wasn't as much of what I'm just going to call raw content, like all of the unique power cards in Spirit Island, all of the different spirits. And that takes a lot of, both a lot of time just to come up with. And then also balancing them, getting a handle on costing them. You know, once you have a framework, you can start evaluating utility and costing things. But in the beginning, it's just this vast, undifferentiated sea because you don't know where you're going yet. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and I came up with like seven pages worth of like, if you were a spirit of myth and legend, how might you prevent people from overrunning your home? And just, you know, no mechanics, just raw, like, you know, anything from, you know, I read a lot of fiction, so anything from fairy tales or fantasy books or, you know, various myths and stories and, you know, religions and whatever, like, what might you do? And then I tried to distill that down into like, okay, here's a page of possible mechanical areas. And that initial, okay, I got to do this. And then once I've done that, then I'm going to try and create very unique spirits out of this as well. And I don't even know what framework this is all in. Like, that, that I'd never done that before, and certainly not on that scale, and that was very just daunting on a morale level. But thankfully, one of my friends and very much the lead developer for Spirit Island, uh, Ted Vesenes, was super enthusiastic about the concept when I was talking it through with him, which kind of gave me the, okay, all right, like, yeah, here's like the, the enthusiasm injection where it's like, okay, I can get over this, I can, I can do this. So that was fantastic. I'll need to think about sort of mid-level towards end. The hardest thing was attempting to split the game out into core game and branch and claw. Oh, because okay. The branch and claw expansion was a re was developed as part of the really the game. yes, huh? Uh, it was all in there. There were rules. There were always rules for like, okay, your first time playing, don't use the tokens, don't use the event deck. Uh, you know, keep it simpler. Mm -hmm. And greater than games convinced me that like we really think that this would do better as an expansion for a variety of reasons. Both it will keep component costs down, and you know we all know that there's people who don't 
play the, you know, do this your first game the first time, and you know how well it goes over when people include all of that stuff in the first game. We may be guilty of that on occasion. Oh, uh, yeah. It, <laughs> as, as, you know, as is our game group, so we usually see, like, you know, here's the recommended easy mode. We're like, ah, no, screw that. Uh, but in this case, there's just enough going on that if you play with all the stuff from Branch and Claw right off the bat, it doesn't actually make the game better because you don't know the game well enough to appreciate the variety. Mm -hmm. There's more stuff going on, but that's not intrinsically an improvement. And it makes the game harder to learn because there's more going on and more exceptions to how the invaders work and all this other stuff. So they convinced me, okay, this would be better as an expansion. And that required pulling apart a bunch of stuff. Some of it was really easy. But then there was the minor power deck. And the metaphor I used for this is that it was like taking a bag of M&Ms which had been dumped and mixed up with molten marshmallow, allowed to set, and now trying to sort them by color. <laughs> because the minor power deck is this, I mean, it may not be evident from looking at it, but this interwoven thing of like, there are very particular, there, there's not just the same, roughly the same amount of each element in the minor power deck, but the pairs of elements, how often they appear together is considered, how often different types of effects crop up. And pulling things apart messed with all of that because, like, you know, uh, the expansion has beasts. And so, unsurprisingly, uh, there's a strong correlation between a power which deals with beasts and powers which have animal element associated. Mm -hmm. So pulling those out left the minor power deck in the core game drastically deficient of animal elements, which in turn means that any spirit which uses those ends up just not working as well for reasons which are totally invisible to the players. They just know that they get crappy power draws all the time. <laughs> uh, and so trying to, to like figure that out and get that all sorted was some really brain-burning work um, and required like, okay. Because yeah, at that point in, in time, you already have this very complex game mm -hmm. that's working well. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I pulled them apart and then it's like, okay, in order to make this work, I need to take, you know, eight cards from each, cut them. And now for, you know, for the core game, now I need to design powers which have the following eight elemental combinations and include the following 17 effects among them, five of which cost one, three of which cost zero, four are fast, four are slow, three target from sacred sites, two of which are co target another spirit, etc., etc., etc. And... It's like, okay, all right, so let's sit down and do this and come up with like a candidate. And, you know, by that point in time, I had power designed down pretty well so I could get a good idea of what would work and what wouldn't. But then there's still the risk of like, oh, and some of them might just not work and need to be replaced, in which case you need to like yank out a couple more and sort of refactor because when one piece doesn't work, you need to either design something else satisfying the exact same constraints which does work or pull it back and readjust so you have different constraints. So that was challenging. It sounds challenging. <laughs> um, you know, satisfying when I was done, but during it, uh, yeah, lots of sort of staring at a piece of paper and lots of little charts and scratch notes. And honestly, I'm still surprised that Branch and Claw was part of the original design because it does seem so much like what you would expect with an expansion, mm -hmm. that it adds more variability, it adds just more cards mm -hmm. it adds more complexity mm -hmm. it seemed like that would have been designed as an expansion from the start well no it was it was it was always there uh when i there are other things which were in the game which have been cut like i started off in the initial stages doing sort of what i call exploratory design where it's like, okay like what are all the pieces i might want in this game let's throw them in and see if they work mm -hmm. and then let's start cutting them out again and when we see what doesn't work and so you know, there, I think there was an early iteration which had seven or eight different token types instead of four. And some of them didn't work at all. And some of them looked like they worked, but then proved not to. And some of them did well and stuck around. Uh, and others worked well, but were a little more complex. And so not quite good enough. And so they ended up getting cut, but might come back in the future. Like that sort of thing. Do you find that process helpful of just kind of going all out and then editing, editing yourself back? Yes. I need to be, you need to be careful with it so that you avoid kitchen sink design. Uh, but at the same time, I also found it helpful for other reasons. Like in the expansion, there's a major power, Fire and Flood, which targets two lands. And part of the reason that that's there is because it's cool. 
And part of the reason that it's there is because that forced me as a designer to consider like, okay, this is a thing which could happen. And so like in the playtesting I'm doing now for the, ex for the next expansion, at one point a, a playtester said, hey, how does this notional special rule for a spirit work if you have a power like fire and flood, which targets two lands? It's like, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, because having played around with it during initial exploratory design, I knew that this was something which, even if it wasn't going to be a strong element, was something that I'd probably want to be doing sometime. And so I wanted to sort of force myself to keep that in mind while I was building out the other pieces. Now, in hindsight, I did this too much. There are some areas where I sort of like, oh, okay, like I want to make sure that I can do this. So let's include a power which does this so that I sort of am forced to pay attention to that. There are times when I erred too far in that direction. And it's like, oh, in hindsight, actually, maybe instead of doing that, I should have left that out because now knowing what I know, uh, I would have worked in a slightly different way. But there's other times like Fire and Flood where I'm really glad that I did, so. I don't know. It's a uh, it's judgment call. I also find it useful because if you go in with that mindset, it forces you into the mindset of, and I'm going to cut things which I have added. Whereas if you start from a minimalist base and then add and only consider yourself as adding, then you'll keep adding and adding and adding and you'll have a mess of a game because you need to cut things in order for it to work. Yeah, in any kind of creation, I find like just wanting to hold on to what I've created yes. oh, is, yeah. is, is so strong. Yes. So I guess you you know up front that you're going to get rid of some things. Yeah, oh, that. you have to. And it's, uh, <laughs> one of my designer friends, Rob Cedar, has, has, a, has a technique which I borrow from liberally, which is if you have something you love in a game and it just like it's just too much, it still works with the game, but it's just too complex, you go, ah, and you tell yourself, it'll be in the expansion someday. <laughs> uh, knowing as you tell yourself this it'll probably never happen but it, it lets you feel good about it as you cut what you need to cut uh, or you just spin it off to its own uh, its own game <laughs> that is the other thing like once you design enough games you'll you'll pull something out and you're like oh this doesn't fit here oh well and then three years later you're like oh that piece fits even better over here this is fantastic <laughs> it's always really gratifying when that happens or you'll see somebody else has designed something which makes use of a similar concept and then you're like, oh, neat. Like, you know, yeah. uh, when, when somebody comes out with an idea, which is something which I like, you know, sort of had an idea in a similar direction, as long as I didn't put in lots of work towards that, I always feel really good because it's like, great. Now I get to see where that might go without having to like spend years on it. It's uh, nicely gratifying. Let's, let's shift over to the look of the game because sure, yeah. I love the look of Spirit Island. So do I. I love the colors. I love, you know, it's it's kind of the antidote to a lot of the the overly dark coloring you see, I guess, more in video games or the, the beige you see in, in a lot of Euro games. It's bright and colorful and yeah. vivid. How much of a hand did you have in kind of the visual design of the game? Was that something that you wanted to do and, and pursued? Or was that more on the publishing side of things? So even before I signed it, I knew that this was a game which sort of wanted to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not true of necessarily of all games like Fealty. It's like I wanted it to look good, to look nice, but theme didn't really demand like this game wants to look awesome. But Spirit Island really did. And I kind of felt that. So when I was, I sort of had it in the back of my mind, like, you know, I, if I'm signing this game, I want to make sure the company I sign it with can sort of do it justice because I feel like it should really look great. Uh, and after talking to Greater Than Games, I felt that they could. And I was heavily involved in the look and feel, sort of the initial look and feel discussion. And then my involvement sort of d lowered over time. And my involvement in like the details of specific illustrations is basically non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, so starting off, Adam and I talked a lot about, you know, what are what is the look? He said that, you know, he had sort of a watercolor feel in mind, just to, just like you said, like to, to not be that like dark, heavy kind of heavy oil feeling, which you mm -hmm. can get in a uh, in, in a lot of games, which sort of more mimic the the oil fine art. But he wanted more of a watercolor, brilliant sort of the the natural saturation of of nature. Those those you know the incredible bright spring green against the brilliant blue sky. 
And I was totally on board with that. I had, you know, a few concerns because I'd seen some watercolors which tended to be very great on the color, but very indistinct on the detail, kind of, you know, fuzzy. Impressionist kind of, yeah. yeah. And I was like, I don't really want to go all the way that direction. I I prefer slightly. So he came up, he showed me something which was like watercolor with inking for like the lines. I'm like, that looks amazing. So, and then we just spent some time with him showing me things and me going, I like that. I don't like that. And here's why. Until he sort of knew my preferences. And then he went off and started figuring out like how everything was going to look. For spirit designs, those mostly got bounced off of me for sort of the concept art. But then the specific arts for the panel or the power cards weren't generally something that I ended up having any input in. Were the the spirit names, which some of them are just wonderful, was that like packaged together with kind of back when you were brainstorming what these spirits could be? Or, or was that something that came in at the end? No, no, that, that's always been part of the game from the get-go. There was a very brief period where I took the sort of low-complexity spirits and to sort of show like, okay, these are the more basic spirits. I, I sort of scaled back their names to like, you know, lightning spirit, river spirit. And all my playtesters said, no, 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 put those other names back. I'm like, okay, all right, got it, you know. It brings me such joy every time I look at the names of the spirits or some of the cards. What was the card I had the other day? The 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 wildflowers whispering something. Oh, twisted flowers murmur ultimatums. It blew my mind. I'm like, this is the greatest card name that has ever been made. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. And then I yeah. think Ocean's Hungry Grasp is one of our favorites. Well, because we, I got this game right. We went. Yeah. Right before we went on a vacation to the Bahamas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which fit. We're like, we have to play Spirit Island while we're on this island in the Caribbean. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> and we were, <laughs> we had such a blast with it. And I was amazed at the names. And then we, we would go out snorkeling because we, we oh, rented a house water, yeah. right on the water. And we go out snorkeling. We found this little uh, bit of reef with this fish in it. Nice. And I named it Ocean's Hungry Grasp. <laughs> it was about that big. <laughs> And uh, didn't look threatening at all. But yeah, the the flowers, was it murmuring ultimatums? Yes. How do you come up with something like that? Uh, do you just sit down one day and just write a list? Kind of, sort of. Uh, I'll think about like, okay, what's something... The, the major powers are also su- all supposed to be sort of, you know, impressive moments for a spirit. Like, mm-hmm. whoa, you did a you did a thing there. That's, wow, you know, that's big. Um, you blew up part of the game board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that card, and I drew it also <laughs> last time we played, but I couldn't afford it, sadly. Oh, it's a, it, it's hard to pull off, but when you can, it's very satisfying. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I always enjoy watching people unbox Branch and Claw and go through, if they start going through all the powers, when they hit that one, I always just enjoy watching the facial reactions. <laughs> Wait, what? Does this do what I think it does? Yeah. This does what I think it does. <laughs> the So yeah, I'll I'll think about just like what's something awesome, terrifying, impressive, impactful which a spirit could do. Sometimes I'll think about it from the perspective of a sort of oral tradition story. Sometimes I'll think about it maybe as if it were a movie. Sometimes I'll think about it I don't know, you know, all right, if I'm on a nature hike, what's what's the most freaky, terrifying thing which could happen in that instant, you know, or, or you know, sort of in, in a given realm, like, you know, the, the, the plants or the geology or the, the waterways, like waterways in which these could turn against you. Sometimes it'll be mechanically informed, like, oh, I'd really like a power which plays around with thing X. Well, what's a big splashy thing which could happen which results in, you know, people running away in terror? Um, that's not a hard one, but <laughs> this could be a b- bigger question than maybe we want to get into. But I, I was wondering earlier when you mentioned that you do play some RPGs yeah. or you have, you enjoy designing that experience. Yes. Honestly, like the only time I can, I ever came up with anything as ridiculous as a flower yeah. m- murmuring, murmuring something terrifying or whatnot it is in that context. Mm-hmm. So, um, did you ever kind of conceive of this this island in that sort of role-playing mindset? I can't help but think that my experience as a GM coming up with things informed sort of the, the process of creativity and coming up with ideas. That's got to be true. I have never considered it specifically as a setting for role-playing, but with that mind of, 
I don't know, uh, setting creator. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that's how a lot of the lore works. You know, it's kind of like a role playing game where the stuff which is on stage is very detailed and intricate, and the stuff which is just off stage, I kind of know where it's going. But then the stuff which has there's never been a reason to talk about is sort of not fully defined. Partly because defining absolutely everything about a world is a terrifyingly vast undertaking, and partly because that way it can shift to meet the needs of in an RPG, the campaign, or in here, the setting, when it ever, you know, when it does need to come on screen, it, it has some flexibility. So, yes, absolutely. Jumping back to the visuals a bit, I think the the pieces for the Dahan, and am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Okay, good. I said Dahan for the longest time, mm-hmm. and then I'm like, eh, it's probably Dahan. Mm-hmm. I think those little wooden pieces work remarkably well, because they're, they're kind of abstract. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem like they would represent people you know we have new players like okay we're gonna move the mushrooms here Mm. but but with like the natural wood Mm -hmm. and just kind of indistinct but seemingly meaningful shape to them it seems to work well was was that something that greater than games came up with was that something that you tried to help with the design so my initial thought for what those pieces would look like was either mini meeples or have you ever played there's a I think it's a Carcassonne variant, where in addition to meeples, you have little huts. Uh, I can't remember which. I haven't it's, played that one. It's, you're, you're placing them on waterways or something like that. Maybe it wasn't Carcassonne, maybe it was something else. It was a tile-laying game of some sort. But in my mind, it was sort of like, oh, it would probably be like, you know, you know, sort of smaller huts like those. But for prototyping, I, you know, got sort of these wood end caps uh, because I'm like, oh, okay, these look enough like huts, you know, the... The tops aren't conical the way that they should be, given the the sort of you know the way that construction would have worked. You know, mm-hmm. It's a, a a lot easier to just put up a post and then put a sort of conical roof around that post. But you know, close enough for a prototype, that's fine. And Greater Than Games liked how it looked so much that they went with uh, a slightly more upscale version of that for the final product. So it was sort of like my. I guess I did it originally. They're the ones who said, yes, this works on a design level. Um, it has always been intentional that they be made of wood. The, the, mm-hmm. wood, the, the wooden paper slash plastic guy, dichotomy in the game is entirely intentional. And yeah, they ended up uh, a little lighter than I'd anticipated. Like the, the colors of... The game has a color scheme too. Where like, you know, the color of the invaders is white. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the colors of the Dahan are brown and black. Mm-hmm. Light is gray. It's kind of in the middle of everything. And the spirits and the natural world are all the colors of the rainbow. So, you know, the particularly in the second and third printings of the game, the Dahan pieces ended up being like, you know, pine or something, which was very pale. Uh, but then in the more recent fourth printing, they got it back, you know, more towards sort of a golden brown. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I assume the white was intentional because, oh, yeah. Yeah. like... There's there's more than a couple games, you know, where you have the natives mm-hmm. and they're just like the black cubes. Yeah. Or, you know, Puerto Rico, I know a lot of people don't like uh, yes. how the natives are kind of displayed as this brown or black cube. Yeah. And so to see the enemies being stark white mm-hmm. and then also plastic, something relatively unnatural, mm-hmm. works on a really nice level, I think. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I was really pleased that they were able to do the plastic sculpts you know in prototypes i was using sort of like you know the the sort of generic pieces and oh the sculpts are nice oh i I think i saw you wrote something either as a designer diary or maybe just in the forums Mm -hmm. about how you came up with the name dahan and i thought it was really interesting could you talk a little bit about that Sure, yeah. I'll probably miss a few details, but, you know, it's online uh, and, and they fill in things which I, which I miss. I always knew that I wanted them to have a name because just calling them the Islanders both sort of anonymizes them in a way which too many games do. It doesn't make it clear that it's not an extant culture, and I try very hard to make the game have, you know, have the, the Islanders be a distinct culture from any place historically. Sort of both so that I wasn't just, you know, grabbing pieces from somebody else's culture indiscriminately. uh, And so that it could, if desired, sort of serve as a fictional stand-in for somebody else's culture if they ever wanted it to. Like, you know, if there's somebody who is from a historically colonized peoples who's like, you know, I kind of want the Dahan to stand in for my peoples. They're fictional. So if they want, they can do that. So, uh, and lastly, because Islander and Invader look really similar when you're skimming. Oh, yeah, yeah. So for all of those reasons, I always knew they were going to have a name, but I sort of pushed it off and pushed it off. Then I'm like, okay, it's time to to do this. So I talked to a 
friend of mine who was a linguistics PhD and sort of came up with like, okay, what are common phonemes across the world? Uh, and came up with not an actual conlang or anything. Like there's no Dahan language notes. You know, I, just, I have like what, what sounds are in their language, but there's no words defined aside from Dahan, at least not yet. But knowing those sounds, it's like, oh, okay, great. Now I can come up with a name which could be plausibly anywhere in the world. Like maybe it's somewhere in the Pacific, or maybe it's in the Caribbean, or maybe it's an island off the coast of Africa, and the name isn't going to localize it. Again, so it can sort of stand in for conflicts in many places and times throughout history. So I'm like, okay, great, I have these, and now I need a name which isn't too long so that people actually use it, because if it's five syllables and really long, then nobody's ever going to say it. And it'll take up lots of space on the cards. This was before I knew that it would be using icons. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, short name, great. Uh, come up with some short names. And, oh, it also sh probably shouldn't be the name of, you know, an existing peoples, obviously, but an existing place would also be good to avoid. And probably, you know, I came up with a couple names and tried one and did a Google search on it. It's like, oh, that's profane in three different languages. Maybe I don't <laughs> want to use that. Um, and it turns out that when you limit yourself to phonemes used everywhere in the world and you limit yourself to short names, that avoiding name collisions is really, really hard. So what I thought was going to be like an afternoon's project turned into about two weeks. Oh, um, man. Not straight, but like, you know, every day or so be like, okay, all right, here we go. Let's just brainstorm like just come up with some names which sound okay or sound good and just type them into you know i was doing google searches i found some site which is like what does this word mean in any language on the globe you know which was not fully comprehensive it missed one or two uh there's at least one indonesian language in which dahan means i think branch or something which i which i missed um, but branch, fortunately, you know, that's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't mean like testicle or exactly, something. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I remember there was one memorable day where I had like seven good candidates and I spent an afternoon at the end of the afternoon. I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, at the beginning, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go with like the best one I get for today. And by the end of the afternoon, I'm like, none of these are acceptable. <laughs> so that was a little demoralizing. But then I... You know, I wish I'd kept a list of like all the failed candidates and why, because it could be... That would have been fascinating. Yeah, I know. I might have it buried on my hard drive somewhere, but uh, at the time, I was just like, you know, no, no, tear, 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 tear. And finally, uh, I, I had an afternoon where I came up with, I think, two different ones, which worked okay. And, oh, there, there were some other constraints, too. Like, if you read it out loud, it needs to not be confusing. Uh, I had an early idea, which was like, atu, A-T-U. But if you say that out loud, like, push one, atu, two... A land without blight. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my god, what are you saying? <laughs> uh, and so that one just sort of failed right off the bat. But then Dahan, Dahan, this this works. It means slow in Tagalog. But I, I checked with a, a a friend of whose family is Filipino and whose you know uh, aunt and mom speak Tagalog, and it's like, you know, like yeah, it means slow, but it's not pejorative. It's not like slowpoke. It means sort of slow in a deliberative sort of fashion, mm -hmm. which actually works really well for the Dahan culture. You know, some people say like, oh, they're purely reactive against the invaders. And part of the reason for that is because it's not very visible. It's sort of at the, the macro level, which the game zooms out to. But that's because they are still making up their minds. There's a, they have a, from their point of view, they have a lot of contradictory information. Like they have, oh, like some of these invaders are being aggressive towards other people, but that's not here. That's over elsewhere on the island. And we don't really know what's going on there in detail. Like maybe something precipitated it. And we hear like think that they're really like out for blood. That can't be true. Is it, you know, sort of, is, is that really so? They'd lived side by side with the invaders, you know, at least semi peacefully in places. And they saw, oh, like, you know, these new, these people from across the waters, like they do things differently. Like there's some things they don't know and need to be taught about, but then there's other things they've learned that we don't know. And hey, metal, you know, metalworking, that's kind of neat. Let's do stuff with this. And so, you know, some of the Dahan see the invaders as like the terrible foreign fiends who have to be repulsed by any means possible. And others see them as our new neighbors who we need to try and get along with and teach about the islands so they don't screw things up. Hmm. Uh, and, and to top it all off, then they've just, as of game start, they've just gotten over getting walloped with all of the very well not all of but many of the various diseases which the invaders have brought over with them which in the game are less deadly than they were in real life because they have some level of assistance with local spirits who aren't going to be affected by human diseases and that sort of bootstraps uh historically you sometimes got casualty rates far higher than you would expect because it hit everybody at once and so nobody could provide palliative care for anybody else 
So instead mm. of like, oh, this is killing 30% of your population, it would kill like 90 to 100% because everybody got sick and so nobody could take care of each other. So if you have, you know, spirits who are able to help some people overcome it more early, that kind of cascades in a virtuous snowball and, the, you know, the Dahan are able to take care of themselves. But still, that you know, that did a number on them and they're picking themselves up after that going, oh, you know, like... What was that? Was that an angry spirit? Like, what's going on here? And they're just realizing, wait, that things which we've seen in their cities, just not so bad. Those are the diseases which came with the invaders. What do we want to do about this? And so at the start of the game, they are very much in a, what do we do? Which is mm -hmm. why they, you know, as soon as they're, they're attacked, they will attack back, but they're not initiating aggression because they're still trying to figure out sort of how things stand. Wow, I didn't know there was all that backstory to it. <laughs> I try it's something which doesn't always if you try and put that level of detail in at the mechanical level like mm -hmm. the game falls over itself but that's also why a lot of the fear cards some of the fear cards involve the Dahan attacking because that is enough of the Dahan seeing like oh this is the nature of the conflict which is shaping up like this is not just those people over there fighting the invaders this is actually an island wide conflict and the spirits are taking the view that the invaders are just bad and need to be gotten rid of. Okay, I guess it's time to act, but seize the moment. Mm -hmm. um, or, oh, like, we want to act, but the invaders outnumber us here. We don't feel safe acting. Oh, we have momentum on our side. Okay, now we'll jump in. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll choose our moment. So there's a lot of that in the, going on in the background. Yeah, as you as you des describe that, like, I, I didn't know all that about mm -hmm. the Dahan, but certainly things you said matched game moments that i've mm. experienced great you know yeah and so i think that's what the game does well is it, it gives a sense of this lore in this unique place for me most obviously in the spirits just like as i as i look at a new spirit card <laughs> i think wow there's there's just some amazing history of this this mm. spirit yeah so like um i just think i think it's cool that you're not writing a book Yes. To convey this story, mm -hmm. but the kind of the sense that the story is out there yeah. is conveyed, which is really sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's remarkable, actually. I, it's so cool to know that there's just that much, that level of thought behind the game. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in some sense, that's probably p part of the reason why we all think it's such a great game is because there's a lot of work there that we haven't seen. I imagine that's probably true of a lot of the games i really 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 like but yeah, yeah. I, I loved hearing about that that's yeah that's I, great I, if i come up with any other sort of uh, uh tangents along those lines i will digress into them. <laughs> <laughs> uh one thing that kind of caught my attention is you said as you were trying to come up with the name you determined the the sorts of syllables or the sorts of sounds that might go into the language mm -hmm. without actually fleshing out a whole language yes and I know in some things, you know, like the Tolkien lore, there is actually an Elvish language. Mm -hmm. But in kind of general fantasy, I've never tried to learn like, oh, this is this language. But when I look at names of different characters, you tend to recognize, oh, the elves have a lot of like apostrophes and L's in their names. Yes. You know, yep. and the dwarves have a lot of like K's and H's and yeah, like harsh syllables. Mm -hmm. And so then when I'm coming up with names for characters in RPGs or games or whatever, I try to think of like what sorts of syllables might go together to to make a name for this character yes yeah actually when i'm when i'm gming i'll do that sometimes and if i'm fleshing out an area I'll end up sometimes taking like going like okay you know let's take a part of you know the globe somewhere in real life and sort of look at what constant mixtures you often see like to give it that certain consistency and feel and try and use those for all the names of a, people in a given region in a role-playing game or something you know not a direct language mapping but sort of a tonal feel i guess to the to the to the oral sound of it yeah yeah, yeah. well and dahan has a kind of a very natural sound to it and, th and this is pushing the limits of what i know of linguistics but like <laughs> when children develop mm -hmm. i know that i don't know the name of it but the first sounds they make are those consonant a vowel sound so la ba oh, yeah, da yeah, yeah. ma yep. and that's what dahan's made of it's dahan like well, yeah, it's, it's it's very much those kinds of sounds that are inherent to just the way our vocal cords develop i think yeah it's it's because that's what you'll see everywhere in the world like exactly yeah the the 
there's different patterns like you know uh, can you if you you know a syllable can have like either you know consonant consonant sound vowel sound but maybe it can just have a consonant sound like can you do that like different languages do different don't what sounds can you have at the end of a word I don't remember all the details now I have a I have a you know sort of linguistics file at home where I have all my notes on that which I look up when I need to reference it which is not very often these days <laughs> I'm curious, is there an, are there any of the spirits that have been released so far that you're particularly fond of? Or that like all your children and you love them equally? I don't love them the same way, but I love them all in a non-quantifiable, awesomely large amount. <laughs> the, the, when I think of different ones, there's different bits which make me go, oh yeah, you know, like, that's awesome. You know, like, if I'm thinking of a, you know, just like to go through the, the base, you know, sort of the four starters, like, if I think of River Surges in Sunlight, that is the spirit whose art I first saw. It was actually mm. the first piece of art at all for the game that I saw ever. And when I saw it, it was like, oh, awesome. Like, this is <laughs> going to be great. And so I had, like, I get that sort of, that, that bit of happy. And the river is often the first spirit which lets people click into how moving the invaders prevents invader actions works. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, like, if I just move, like, I don't need to, kill things in order to be devastatingly effective i can just like move this one explorer and that prevents the entire build ravage cycle and, and seeing people in playtest games and at conventions click into that there's that moment of oh yeah i can do this and you know as opposed to the the you know the boom boom wah you know lightning i i, I think you know there's people going ha, 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 you know sort of like the pummeling things with their fists yeah. i i Which actually awesome. i distinctly <laughs> remember when i realized that yeah it's like, oh, I just move them out of the way. And then we just had that land type and might not show up for a long time. Yep. They, can, they can just sit there and yeah. chill. The first time I played was with the river and the ocean and someone else who could move a little bit. We just had oh, this, I had the... Uh... We were just washing them out to sea. It was, yep. That was my first experience with the game. It was great. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then we have ocean. You yep. know, movement becomes really powerful. <laughs> Well, the related question: What uh, what are your kids' favorite spirits? Are they, oh, they aware of them? No, my kids are no. three and five. Oh, three. Okay, yeah, all right. Give it a couple years. Yeah, no. Uh, Not my, even like on the box. You're like oh. my my older my, my my older son has has asked to play, has watched us playing, and has gone so far as to be able to correct me, identify certain things, just in terms of like he's watched us play enough that he can say like you know that's a this, this is a that. You know, like the powers with the red rings are fast, the powers with the blue rings are slow, but he's not to the point where he can play yet. But for his age, he has a lot of focus and he's played a lot of games. So like as soon as he's to the reading level where he can start in, I'm guessing he will probably enjoy playing. One of the things which has been a totally unanticipated boon from Spirit Island is, you know, during all of my wife won't play my prototypes because she says, you know, I don't like having to relearn the rules every time I play things. Um, and in general, she doesn't play a lot of board games. Like, she really enjoys abstract positionals like, you know, Pente or Yinch or the like. But beyond that, generally the board games I play are not so much her thing. And so after Spirit Island came out, she, you know, she's like, yeah, I want to try your game. Like, now that it's out and the rules aren't changing all the time. So she sat down and she played it. And she really, really likes it. <laughs> with the That's net great. Then I now play board games with her probably, like, Five to ten times as often as I used to. It used to be a, like, you know, once a year, maybe, thing. And now it's, you know, probably on the order of once or twice a month, which is fantastic. Yeah, my wife, Amber, she likes board games, but she she finds them almost as work mm -hmm. to do. And she doesn't, like, really like games. Mm -hmm. So she likes to play them, like, if we set aside some time on a Saturday. Yep. So you can get, get in her mindset and then we'll sit down and play, like falling sky or something like yeah, yeah. she likes the really big nice. thematic heavy games yep. and, and the, but it's like come on just play like a quick like 45 minute game with me i gotta review this game but yeah. it's interesting how different people approach okay. games differently like to her to me like it's exhilarating to do the thought process of working through a board game to her it feels like it's going back to work again mm -hmm. and she loves work and she loves that kind of thinking but she needs breaks Yes. Yeah. She, she doesn't want to come home from work and then go back into that yes. that kind of thinking. Something can be loads of fun but still take energy to do. Yeah. Something I find really interesting with any game is to go on to the Board Game Geek forums, mm -hmm. go to the strategy section, mm -hmm. and see what kind of 
balance issues people are complaining about. Oh, yeah. And I know a Spirit Island, there's lots of discussion about what's what are the really powerful spirits and what are the ones that aren't as powerful. Yep. So my question is, mm-hmm. I'm sure you're aware of these discussions. Yes. What spirit are people underestimating the strength of? Ah. Oh. So I'll give the obligatory preface, which happens in all of these discussions, which is that part of it really depends on context, what adversary you're fighting in particular. Sure, yeah, yeah. So you sort of have to say, okay, assuming a generic adversary, because even Brandenburg, Prussia, distorts the game by speeding it up, which means that spirits which work best in the late game, you know, which build up to massive power levels later on, never... You know, they have a harder time getting to hit their stride because they're just, you know, flattened up against the fence so quickly. Which are people underestimating? It's hard to say because, you know, I read these discussions, but the opinions I see most often are the people I tend to play with. Or not play with personally, but playtesters who are giving feedback. And so I have mostly their views. One I see consistently underestimated uh, among newer players is Vital Strength of the Earth because the so much of, of Earth's efficacy is bound up in that free defend three and sacred sites. But the fact that you can use those to set up counterattacks is something which, until you queue into that, it's great for not losing, but it doesn't help you win. And uh, that tends to be, Earth, like, Earth is great at not losing until the deck runs out. Yeah. Um, but then winning. So that would be there. And going the other direction and thinking, like, which spirits are not underestimated? If I remember correctly, the... A lot of people think ocean's really powerful, which I would mm-hmm. agree with, because mm-hmm. it just makes it makes moving better yes. for everyone. Yeah. And then what's the the one that throws influence everywhere? Um, Rampant Green. Rampant Green, yes. I think, is really good. I've had a lot of success with that one. Yes. And if I remember right, people online agreed with me. Yep. Yeah. There was somebody who said, like, you know, part of it is that it, is that it amps up anybody else it's with, uh, which is yeah. very true. Uh, the So, yeah, if I had to say one spirit that gets... Ironically, I'd say actually maybe both of the spirits from Branch and Claw. Yeah, I was just saying one of our yeah. patrons just commented yeah. that he thinks Sharp Fangs is the weakest, though he loves playing it. I just actually, in our last game, I played that one for the first time. It seems very difficult to get. The comment which I saw in one of these strategy discussions, which I tend to agree with, is that it's not that Sharp Fangs' absolute power level is lower. It's that it is somewhat more dependent on the luck of the draw. Yeah. Now, it partially compensates for it on a power card angle in that it can accumulate a ferocious number of power cards. Uh, its power <laughs> card game is potentially phenomenal. And once it, it is also sometimes under, uh, underestimated because it tends to be at its most potent when it has you know, about four card plays with that reclaim one space. But the early game tempts you hard into going down the energy track. Yeah, that's what I did. And... That works, but it, you hit a local maxima where it's like, okay, I am now reasonably effective. Like basically it's a trade of short-term efficacy for long-term efficacy. You, be, you ramp up faster, but you, and you have the ability to go major powers more readily, but you lose, I don't know what the, like, what the descriptor would be for it. There, there's one play, uh, uh, Rebecca Vesness is the play tester who is usually my go-to person for Sharp Fangs testing. But when, you know, when she's on a roll with it, it's just like, whoa, okay, all right. You know, it's like, here are the five things I'm doing, and I'm killing all of these, this, the other. Oh, yeah, sure, they're blighted here, but I'm removing the blight here and here, this, that, the other thing. Okay, I've got my board and half of yours. How are you doing? Like, it's like, <laughs> okay, right there. Um, all right. And uh, and then it's like, and then a beast event comes up and everything just gets eaten. It's like, all right. But the the point which has been made online is that while Sharp Fang, because Sharp Fang is first innate, which once you get rolling is super useful, because it can't target lands with blight, you end up with a, as long as you keep things under control, you're okay and can do really well. But as soon as you fall off, then lands blight and you can't hit them with that and you have trouble defending them further. So it's one of those, uh, while you're doing well, you keep doing well, but then when you fall off, you kind of end up wiping out. It's a win more power. Exactly. It's, it's, yeah. a, win, it's a win more or, 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 or a get hurt power. The, there's also That's a, exactly what happened with us, actually. Because yeah. we got we got hit with the blight effect, which was take off three influence. Mm. And I was left with one. Yeah. And then yep. it was, oh, we were playing we had with... a really bad ravage. And we got a bunch of blight. Yep. Well, we were playing with, what was England. the... With England. Oh, yes. And, and we got hit with two of the same land types in a row. That right was, when that, that was, happened, that was brutal. Yeah. it was bad. 
<laughs> it was really bad. It's really bad. And Sharp Fangs is weak against England because picking off explorers, which it's really good at, doesn't do much. It does have the invaders don't build, which can go a long way towards helping make up for that, but it doesn't fully make up for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yes, Sharp Fangs. Sharp Fangs also has a subtle disadvantage, which is not readily apparent unless you inspect the minor power deck closely which is that uh, animal and plant are considered opposed elements. Oh. And those don't crop up together on power cards quite as often as the unopposed elements do. Now, this is least distinct. This is least true of animal plant. Those crop up nearly as much as the others. But statistically, like there's a very small percentage by which you're being invisibly handicapped. I think of the published spirits is the only one which really relies heavily on, the, on an opposed element combo. Some of the stuff I'm working on right now relies more heavily on it, and as a result, some of the minor powers I'm including help balance that out more, so that's less of a big deal. I think I might play that one again next time. I think I want to try to get good at, at <laughs> my, Claws. My advice would be, don't try against England. Like, <laughs> Try anyone but England yeah, next yeah, time. England is the master class with, 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 uh, yeah. with Sharp Fangs. Yeah, try with, try with somebody else. Uh, and like, Don't focus too much on the top row. Yeah, like the, the the top row is the is the short term. Yes, I can hit my thresholds. Yes, I can play the energy, get all the energy I want. Like, but sometimes it's just worth it to like you know if you can manage to make enough breathing room that you can afford it, take the energy from the from growth, which I know a lot of people like never want to do that unless they absolutely have to. Sometimes it's the, like doing it once can sometimes tide you over for many turns. Right. Uh, yeah. Because you're generating so many minor powers with them. Exactly. So like if you can just do it once at an opportune moment. Slam plays, and then you get to the point where it's like, yeah, I'm just hitting my first in a every single turn while I'm dumping beasts on the board and doing all of these other things. Because like, you know, one card play is general. If you have the power cards and energy to make use of it, is much better than one energy is. So you know, being able to put out three cards a turn instead of two for sharp things is huge, and being able to put out four with a free reclaim so you can cycle whatever's best in that moment is phenomenal. Yeah, I think we're starting to get to a point where I'm trying to consider like spirit combinations versus a specific scenario or mm -hmm. adversary. Yes. And I'm like, all right, against, you know, Sweden, we really need to keep the the size of these things down so we don't get the double blight yep. coming out. And maybe we want a faster ramp for that or, yep. or something. And I, I haven't theory crafted what those combos are, but I'm trying to start to look for them. Yeah, so. yeah. they do exist. Well, well, I mean, if you look at the cards, some of them tell you. Like some of the scenarios this, say this like, is weaker against yeah yeah we did the one the ritual of terror I think yeah, where you that one gather was all fun yeah yeah and we played with thunder speaker which made it a lot easier yes so, that was like on easy done. mode yeah yeah you have all the good, the good movement there yeah doing that with keeper of the forbidden wilds gets interesting and tricky on the one hand you have very powerful dahan movement but it's really awkward to set up <laughs> yeah 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 you know you're basically trying to It'd be like, no, not here, no, not here, no, not here, and at the same time set up for fighting the invaders. So, so um, one thing that I really like about Spirit Island is that none of the six games that I've played mm -hmm. have been any you know the same at all. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like it's a different combination of of spirits. I'm playing a new spirit that I get to figure out. The scenario is different. The invaders are different. Like, so was that kind of variability that that gives the game replayability was that something that was like is that just a design principle that you valued from the beginning or is it just because you had this this all these mechanics that fit together well that that just came with it it was what i was shooting for from from day zero the reason that i went through that you know five page brainstorm of things spirits might do was because i wanted all the spirits to be highly asymmetrical but at the same time, I didn't want to have literally, a, I didn't want to go all the way to where, say, a game like Vast does, where each of the different factions literally has its own mini rulebook. So I needed a, a layer in between, a structural layer of rules which could be adaptable to a wide variety of different types of play and different types of power. So the, the spirit, when I, when I first started building the underpinnings of the game, I wasn't working with those that variability. Like the, the very first playtests, the, the unique powers for each spirit were simulated by, I'm going to draw two minor powers and give them to you. And, uh, and the spirits didn't have any innate powers. I knew that I wanted them eventually, but it's like, before I can even get there, I need to understand, you know, before I can build the first story, I need the basement. And before I have the basement, I need the foundation. So... 
all of that stuff was sort of like very just, you know, minimal possible thing which will work so that I can get the other stuff down yeah. and then get that fit and shaped before I start layering on top of it, which is part of why it took five years because sometimes I'd like build a couple of stories up and then go, oh, given the stresses of this system, I need to change this thing three stories down and that has ripple effects which affect everything above it and now I need to go back yeah. and adjust everything and fine tune. Did you play with the the invader tempo at all like w one of the things that surprised me the first couple of times playing it was just how quickly things mm. happen where they're quickly building and then mm. ravaging but then you can remove more than i expect yep. so was that sort of tempo early on or did that get adjusted the very first versions had a deck which had two of every terrain in it which was just shuffled up. Maybe you removed one at random, I think. So, you're, But you're always guaranteed to get at least one of every terrain card. And on your first pass through the deck, you the invaders would, you know, there was the, the, there was the explore, build, ravage cycle. Uh, that was there from the very early days. Uh, but the first pass through the deck, they would act once per turn. And then the second pass, once you reshuffled once, then they would act twice, once mid-turn, once at the end of the turn. That eventually changed over to stage one, stage two, stage three, where instead of having to remember to do two invader phases per turn, you simply have the stage three cards have two different terrains on them, so you're handling them both at once. The core invader cycle came out of a bunch of experimentation for like, all right, I want the invaders to be doing what sorts of things are they doing? Well, they're going to be exploring new lands because that's one of the tropes which is being inverted. They need to fortify, reinforce somehow, like they can't just have people in pith helmets like that doesn't really work because the the colonization is also a trope of it and that could have been joined with ravage with them doing something bad but i found that tempo wise it worked better to have like build up like you know i am getting more powerful and now i hit you It'd be two separate steps so that you could have that moment to block have that moment to counter punch before you got hit in the face the early versions sort of had all of those things happening in arbitrary terrains and i found that it was super unsatisfying when they kind of whiffed because oh now they're ravaging in the jungles but they haven't done anything in the jungles so it's just kind of a non-event and it was super satisfying when they had a seemingly logical progression of like oh we're gonna do something like why don't we just bake that in and just make it so it always works that way and it gave that level of look at it and i'm like oh excellent and now you can plan because i like planning in my games <laughs> it's a it's usually a good thing in a game we we start off in the beginning talking about Kind of the impetus for the game was the theme. Mm -hmm. But you did mention that you always think of kind of the player experience, what you want them to be feeling. Was there a main kind of thesis? Okay, this is the main emotional experience I want people to have when playing that you were thinking about when designing it? Yes. And it came about because there were, there were, there were some people who were giving feedback on the game saying... I think you're shooting for emotional experience X. And in order to do that, I'd suggest A and B. And I'm like, but I'm not really shooting for emotional experience X. And it forced me to pin down sort of more of what I was looking for. Part of Spirit Island has been pointed out, you know, there's a certain measure of power fantasy in it. Like, you know, I am becoming big and awesome. But it's not just that. You don't start off big and awesome. You start off you know, relatively speaking, small and weak, not entirely ineffectual. Like one of the things people say they like is that, you know, from the get-go, you may be, it may seem like you're getting overwhelmed, but you are accomplishing things with every turn. The invaders may be accomplishing more, but so it's not quite, and it's not a hero's journey because that carries a whole bunch of baggage, which isn't really appropriate in this particular case, but it is one of overcoming adversity. It is feeling like, this is really hard like you know like we're really in a bind and we have to step up stepping up is is, is not a, if i had to give like a, a a one phrase thing which would do it it's like okay we need to step up our game if we stay as we are then it will be ruinous we have to become better than we are more than we are different than we are uh, on a thematic level all of the spirits that you play like that, that that you know that single land you have presence in at the beginning of the game is is a very, it's a very macro scale like if you zoomed in you could make an entire board out of that one land and you'd be in like a couple of different places and you are sort of a a, a mid-sized spirit no, certainly not one of the largest but also certainly not one of the smallest and you as a spirit are choosing to 
become a greater form spirit, which carries costs. Part of the reason why the invaders speed up towards the end of the game is because thematically you are slowing down. Bigger spirits in the universe of Spirit Island act more slowly, move more slowly. They are bigger, they are much more powerful, but they operate on the time scale of decades to centuries. So there are spirits who could probably just eliminate all of the invaders just like that, snapping their fingers, but it's going to take 150 years for them to notice what's going on. Mm -hmm. And by that point, it's just going to be too late. The only spirits who thematically are in a place to really fight the invaders are the ones who are currently small enough to interact with the world on a human time scale, who are willing to sort of become bigger. And because they're just in the middle of becoming bigger, they can reach the power level they need while still being fast enough to use that power in an effective fashion. But, you know, if there were a post game to Spirit Island, then, you know, if you play Lightning Swift Strike and you win, it, Lightning Swift Strike will become a much bigger spirit, but it will be the spirit of the thunderstorm which sweeps through, you know, once in a generation and the entire night sky is lit with lightning, but not nearly as frequently. Um, and so that sort of, and that's a change for a spirit. That's something that they're not going to do just for a whim. Spirit emotions aren't really comparable to human ones, but, you know, it's a big life change. Um, yeah. You know, it's like going away, living overseas, having kids, marry, you know, raising a family, whatever. Um, you know, those are big human life changes. This is a big spirit life change. It's, it's changing its nature. Uh, and one of the sort of sub-themes of the game is how will you change in the face of adversity? You know, when you acquire new power cards, you are literally changing your nature. There was a great question somebody asked on one of the uh, Greater Than Games forums, like, it seems weird to me that wildfire could, you, could call up a tsunami. Like, how is that possible? And the answer is at the start of the game, it isn't, which is why they don't have that power card. Uh, but by taking that power card as wildfire, you are changing. You are no longer just a spirit of fire. You are now a spirit of fire and of water, and perhaps you are a spirit of overwhelming, of inundation. And, you know, one thing which I know some people do is at the end of the game, they look at their power cards and they give their spirit a new name based on the power oh, cards wow. they have, which I think is awesome. Uh, I'll do it sometimes too, especially if I've had some events come up. Uh, I played Shadows Flicker Like Flame once where I picked up a bunch of powers which work really well for support of Sharp's Fangs behind the leaves. And so by the end of the game, I'm like, I am totally Shadow of the Predator. Like, you know, because <laughs> uh, we were doing all kinds of awesome stuff together. So yeah, like you know, when you get a new power, that's part of you. Um, that's why reclaiming once you've played all your cards is most effective because it is you are at your most powerful when you have expressed all elements of your nature. And the spirits, which are, uh, it tends to be water and earth spirits, which are really good at saying, okay, this is all of my nature, but for earth, I'm going to hammer on this one point of it over and over, and that's okay because I am Earth. And for water, the sort of flexibility, fluidity, and this part of me is in a cycle, in an eddy, in a current, and it's coming back again, and now it moves on again. So you'll tend to see, you know, strong reclaim on Earth and Sun spirits, and, you know, reclaim one crops up more often with uh, water and, I think, plant and animal, you know, that sort of thing. As you're saying that, I'm remembering a couple games ago where you were the ocean, and we were planning, I was yeah. uh, bring up dreams and, and nightmares. Yes. So it's like, okay, I'll handle the fear. Yep. Uh, ocean can handle kind of board control. Mm -hmm. We had lightning in there and I can't remember who the fourth player was. But just through the cards you drew, you ended up going heavy, heavy fear. Yeah, and I, 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 I was feeling bad for a couple of rounds because I was falling behind kind of and keeping yep. my area in check. Uh -huh. But then, yeah. We ended up doing just, a fear victory. We went through the whole deck. Which yeah. I think was the first time we've won with fear. Which was a 14-card yeah. um, fear deck, too. Which was, ah, nice. We generated 39 fear on the last round. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. In the fast power phase. <laughs> yeah, but no, that... No, it was it, it was incredible. It, it, exactly what you're describing. That kind of transformation yes. as the ocean. And I think that that's the first time I'd played a spirit for the second time. Uh, I was excited to play the ocean just because I, I think it's cool. But then had a very different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on where you go with it. It's, uh, and sometimes things will crop up. It just, uh, yeah, last summer, like after the game's retail release, I was uh, playing, I think it was Lightning, and picked up Gift of Power as my first uh, minor power. Because I didn't get anything which matched elementally. I'm like, well, yeah, but Lightning really wants, uh, you know, minor powers. It's, it tends to be bound by its power card availability. So I'll take this because it works well mechanically. And it ended up steering the spirit in an entirely different direction, both thematically and in playstyle. Uh, it's like, oh, this constraint, which is normally a big problem, just isn't anymore. 
but I'm not hitting my innate as often. I'm not as big, thundery, boomy, but I've become tool, very toolboxy. It's so cool. And I love how you say, I really understand what you mean when you say that it's about kind of stepping up and learning to overcome it. I remember in my review, I really tried to emphasize that by the midpoint or end of a game of Spirit Island, like even if you end up going to lose, mm -hmm. you feel like you're awesome. <laughs> like you can do something now that's bigger yep. and crazier than you thought that you could do before. Mm -hmm. yep. And it kind of sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. I think Mage Knight's the same way for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how if you've played Mage I've Knight. Played, uh, a small handful of times, never close enough together twice in a row to not have to relearn the rules. <laughs> yeah. Shame, but... but it's kind of like, you know, you're ga you're you know, both games you're gaining cards yep. and you're gaining new powers. And it's not till you kind of like look back at the early game. Yes. You're like, wow, I'm really awesome now. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and I, I I have to lead this into just asking how fun was it to create what's the, the serpent oh a serpent slumbering beneath the island yes because that's like the ultimate manifest manifestation of it yep. and i remember when we got the pack uh -huh. and orion played it initially and we're like okay we got to hold on for this stupid <laughs> snake to come up and he was able to trigger the innate oh, the, the ultimate innate power nice. yeah. and we were like literally jumping up out of our chairs <laughs> We were at the point where we ran out of minis. We had every oh, wow. plastic piece on the board. And we were using energy as like, you know, to add. We had to food. find like tokens to put it on. And we were playing, it was England, right? Yeah, probably England tends to be the one where that happened. And we had okay. like four or five spots that had six buildings oh, on God, them. Yes. <laughs> and we spent the last like round before he was able to do it, just moving buildings around. So we wouldn't hit the seven building loss condition. Come on, Come and on. then, <laughs> and then we were sitting there and like, what if I gave you some some elements? Uh -huh. He's like, okay, let me let me count it out. <laughs> Spent about five minutes and he was able to do it. It was, That's I loved it so first, much. The first round of just like four damage, four damage, three damage, four damage, like on every spot. Yeah, was, stop, 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 yeah. stop. And I and I just imagine like he must have just been like on his computer designing this thing and cackling. <laughs> it's uh... like how fun was that? He's like, okay, I'm gonna create the ultimate late game spirit so for that and for for most of the major powers but especially things like innates when i create them it's a combination of feeling this yes 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 and i hope this works because <laughs> there's a real fine line to be drawn between especially again for the innates like it being momentous and badass and phenomenal but if it's too easy then a it doesn't feel as ultimate and B, it breaks the game. And if it's too hard, it never happens. And it's just a tease. So finding that balance point, same thing for uh, hitting the threshold on Cast Down Into the Briny Deep. Like, you know, that's something where you see it, it's like, okay, that this has to happen sometimes, but it can't happen too often. But And I hope I can find that balance point because I totally want this to be awesome and in the game. So it, it's always there. This is on my mind because at the moment I'm working on major powers. Uh, okay. And, and in fact, earlier today, I was working on some major powers before coming over and had that. It's like, I want this to exist. I want this power card to be a thing where people can be like, can I do that? I, is that going to be useful? I, I, think that's, I think that's worth the cost. All right. Let, let's see if we can make this happen. We made it happen. Yes. You're like, you know, um, but, you know, making sure that it hits all those points and it's not too easy, not too hard is uh, sometimes requires a lot of tanker. Um, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, no, for Serpent, and, and similarly for Serpent overall, because even without that innate power, like, you know, the, the like, one play, time passes, two plays, time passes, four plays, five plays, 12 energy a turn, oh my god, you know, <laughs> yeah. cats and dogs living together, that, that, again, same sort of thing, like, you need to make sure that it doesn't happen too quickly, but that it's achievable, and so forth and so on. One of the things I really like about Serpent is that you can escape its core presence throttle you know the the presence limit if you're willing to let your presence be destroyed that you can get around it but if you do that then your ultimate isn't nearly as strong and so it's like okay is this worth the trade-off like is getting with you know do I, jumping through fewer hoops in order to get to that 12 energy and four card plays a turn like i can do that but i'm not going to be able to wreck every land on the board should we do this? Should we not? Like, it gives you choices about how you hit that late game ultimate power, which I think is nice. It's not just, okay, I'm going to sit here and wait. 
when you're making all those choices through the lens of what's happening as this game progresses and what and like what you what, what your teammates need. will let you do to them exactly and like like we have to we have to take care of this now yep. <laughs> serpent <laughs> you know that sort yep. of thing in in like it just felt like we were all in, in that game it felt that we were all sacrificing cuz we all wanted to make this yes. happen and that's ideally like what you do with you know, serpent is an incredibly strong late game uh, i think the term is carry from like you know online uh, uh, you know lane defense games where it's like okay if you can if you can get them to late game they can carry you but they can't extend you need to extend the game that long for them bringer of dreams and nightmares can be similar like i i, I sometimes say if you're playing bringer of dreams and nightmares in a low player count game once you get to four players they're only generating like you know one spirit sphere in a very large pool so it's not as true but in a, a, a two player game it's like okay if we can hit the late game eventually you know the invaders are on a clock because Bringer will end the game on fear before the invaders run out the invader. You know, assuming they hit a couple of good major powers and they have some nice juicy lands to target. So you need to survive and make sure that Bringer can get you there. <laughs> because they're good at defense in some ways, but they're not so good at blowing stuff up. And so the invaders just tend to accumulate and accumulate. Um, yeah, and it seems like with the added spirits that you you have in the expansion and in, in the, the promo pack, yep. that they're a little bit more specialized than what you saw in the base game, yes, I think the, generally. Yeah, to an extent. Although that's that's a little deceptive because the base game includes four spirits which are designed to be non-over-specialized for learning the game. Sure. Uh, although they also all have their weaknesses. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. lightning dealing with explorers is, you know, like somebody trying to squash ants with a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. But, but my thought is that, or I, I suppose my question is, as you think about creating new spirits... Mm -hmm. Are you thinking about the potential for how much that spirit needs to rely on their teammates? So in other words, like, you know, in the base game, Thunderspeaker or Spread of Rampant Green might not need as much help yep. as as some of the other ones. But Serpent certainly does. Serpent does. Ocean. Uh, Ocean does. does. Yeah. Uh, so the way I end up, I'm forced to think about that because one of my more active high-level playtesters plays a lot of solo games mm. and when you're playing solo like aside from you can target yourself with powers which normally only target another spirit there's no rules changes and you just kind of got to cope he has i believe he's beaten max level adversaries with i know he's beaten like difficulty eight or nine adversaries with every spirit he may have that's insane yeah you know yeah, he's he's very good at the game. solo with dreams and nightmares yes wow yeah yeah no dreams and nightmares can, can pull some pretty impressive stuff when it when it gets going because i mean because if you can manage to get rolling like you know you hit a point where it's just like uh, you know here is how long a clock i have on blight all i need to do is make you run away before then uh, i did a, i did i posted a transcript of a solo game with dreams and nightmares against i think level three brandenburg prussia at one point and uh, i posted that to the forums on greater than games i won pretty handily doing i did i think 36 fear the last turn um, oh, man. something like that i can't remember like i blew through the i hit a fear victory and got like four or five fear cards besides or maybe only two or three i i over overkilled by two to three fear cards uh and earned like five or six in the final turn but that was comfortable like i used poisoned land specifically to add more blight cascading to lands with blight deliberately so i could hit harder with the land thrashes in furious pain which is usually a terrible idea but in this case it was a one-two combo which well, it's like okay i can do a bazillion fear so uh, mm -hmm. it'll work out okay so yeah bring up dreams and nightmares can do some pretty astonishing things yeah i played them last time when mark was the um the, the, claws, the claws the claws yeah. oh yeah uh, that was... thanks behind the leaves yes and um i got to a point like right before we lost where i was like if i reclaimed i could generate like 16 fear a turn or something yep. if i could keep my energy up yep but it's just too late at yes. this point so yeah we got we got hammered on that yeah. was that two player or was that bigger two player yep. that was that was a rough one yep. yeah yeah well, it's a uh, bringer of dreams and nightmares tends to want some support like doing 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 the solo defense is hard uh and sharp fangs is probably not the ideal teammate to do that like especially on england each of them against england really kind of wants a supporting partner uh although yeah uh yeah i mean bringer of dreams and nightmares mid to late game really loves lands built up with lots of cities 
<laughs> lands with lots of cities. Oh, yeah. If you could find a big damage card and yeah, drop it, it's yeah. so much fear. It's like, oh, you know, you look at those cities, you're like, all those people to terror. <laughs> you know. The next question I have is actually from one of our patrons when we announced that you were going to come in and, and talk with us. Great. They They asked... Because they've had a couple of rules questions on the forums, oh, sure. and they noticed a trend that whenever there's a little bit of ambiguity yep. or you kind of have to make a ruling, you tend to rule in favor of the players. Mm-hmm. And he he was like, well, you know, most of the time, you know, in a co-op game, the uh, ruling is against the players. Right. Like, I know I've seen multiple games where that's written in the rule books. It's like, right. if you see any ambiguities, just take the worst thing. Right. Why rule in favor of the players? Primarily, this goes back actually to a single rules question, which is in the four player board layout, are the four, you're the four lands which meet at a point in the middle. And it's the only place where you have lands meeting at a corner instead of an edge. And originally, the ruling was that lands which meet at a corner are not considered adjacent because I was thinking sort of, well, thematically, like there's no shared border, so they're not really next to each other. But I kind of knew, like, but it's plausible either way. But then uh, Paul from Greater Than Games pointed out, he said, if people do this, you know, run into this during the, during the game, some of them are going to stop and look up the answer online, but others are just going to, you know, make a temporary ruling and keep playing. And if you say that they're not adjacent, then people who ruled that they were are going to be like, oh, we cheated. Like, whoops, didn't mean to do that. And, you know, it's not a big deal, which it isn't. Like, most of the... Most of the rules mistakes which which you'll make will just make the game a little harder or a little easier, you know, unless you unless you make the mistake of treating blight cascades to all adjacent lands, then you know that one's. If you pull a pandemic, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the, pro- the prototype rule book had a sidebar which said, "This is not pandemic." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> publisher rule that we didn't need to get quite that explicit, but there's a reason that there's like double underlines and stuff. Um, because just that has enough mind space in the zeitgeist of co-op gaming that some people just assume you know, that it, it, it goes to all adjacent lands. But he said, but if you say that they are adjacent, then if people made that ruling, they'll go, oh, great, okay, we played it correctly. And if they make a different ruling, then they go, oh, well, it was a little bit harder, but we still won anyway. Or, oh, maybe that was to blame for our victory. Okay, well, yeah, we'll get them next, or for our defeat, we'll get them next time. And so then for, there's a bunch of rules, questions, which will come up where what the answer is doesn't matter so much as that there is an answer. Like, it's like, you know, there need, there should be a ruling here, but it is not critical to game balance that it be one way or the other. Like, you know, like the four corners are those adjacent. Like, it really plays fine either way. The, the, the difference in sort of the conceptual this game versus that game, they're nearly isomorphic. And so in those cases, I'll tend to err on the, well, okay, like, if it's not a big deal, sure, the players can do that. Like, that's that's fine. If, the, if, it, if, it's, if a ruling like that ever has major unintended consequences, I may go back and revisit. I had to do that once. A, oh, what was it? It was something regarding indestructible to Han. I can't remember. Like there was some ruling on, or off the top of my head. I was like, sure, do that. And then somebody said, well, what about X and Y? That has consequences Z. And I'm like, okay, maybe this isn't the right answer. Okay, all right, no, I apologize. No, we'll retract that. We'll go with this because otherwise things just stop making sense. Um, but in general, I'll try and be permissive because it creates those little like feel good moments instead of feel bad moments Mm -hmm. because it's in keeping with the theme of like okay like you know we're becoming more badass we're overcoming adversity and because the game is already throwing lots of challenges at you like if this makes the game slightly easier for you in a number of small ways and you're feeling like oh well this game's too easy crank it up like (laughs) the game can be cranked up uh to Any level of difficulty you desire. Like, if you're beating top-level adversaries, you know, difficulty 10, although England 6, by the way, is probably really difficulty 11. Uh, You know, top-level... I am not, incidentally, the best Spirit Island player. I'm an extremely good Spirit Island player, Mm -hmm. but there are playtesters who are better at it than I am. Yeah, we've we've slowly (laughs) worked our way... We're around 4 or 5 is a really nice challenge for us. Level 4 or 5 or the difficulty 4? Uh, difficulty four yeah. or five. We usually play basic, no scenario, yeah. and just uh, you know, level two adversary or three adversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, like they tell me that England six probably should be harder than Brandenburg six, and I can believe it. But if you really hit those levels and you want to keep going, you can because you can do a, 
a top level adversary and a scenario. You know, Ted Vesemes, who I mentioned, and, and Rebecca, you know, they, at one point they're like, yeah, you know, we kind of felt that like, you know, level five Brandenburg pressure was getting old. So I've started doing like level four or five and throwing scenarios on top of that, like Dahan Insurrection. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think by the time you hit the highest levels possible, yep. you've gotten your money's worth. Yep. Oh, and just uh, and you know, and just in case you want more variety for for the expansion, we're playing around with rules for combining adversaries, so you can play against an adversary which is like you know, well, what if England conquered Sweden, and you know, now you're dealing with both of them at a lower level instead of just ramping up one of them. Oh, uh, so it's uh, that's going pretty well. It turns out, weirdly enough, that the difficulties are roughly additive. Huh. How this <laughs> happened, like this was not designed the scales were meant to, i mean scale, just go with it <laughs> the scales are meant to be linear insofar as like one level of difficulty increase is meant to be like you know this is about the smallest unit of meaningful increase you can get which isn't noise a difficulty increase of two is about the smallest unit that i can actually tell when i'm playing against but you know with enough testing you can kind of tease out at slightly lower resolution than that but as england six so shows sometimes like you know we're off by one so like i can believe that they're roughly additive but the fact that that actually happens and sometimes it's roughly it's not exactly but the fact that it's even roughly i'm immensely pleased it's a wonderful serendipity that's great yeah. well let's talk about that you mentioned a couple times you're working on a new expansion yes. uh, I, I, what can you say about that it has so you've seen or if you want to say things you're not allowed to say about it <laughs> go ahead and do that too uh, give me the I scoop <laughs> I guess sort of the overall broad overview is that largely it is a more things expansion. You know, it's not intended to expand the game with like uh, uh, huge different rule sets or anything. Now, that being said, I'll give the caveat like for Branch and Claw. You know, Branch and Claw also wasn't, but like, you know, it has the rules for tokens. And then there's also, okay, how does minus health effects work? And what happens when you get more than one invader card in the same space on the board? Like there's sort of, um, you know, there's some new things which have some rules load and some new effects which you know they're not complicated but you need to know how they work the new expansion is intended to be similar not as many new things you know i'm looking at the moment of uh you know it's probably between zero and two new types of token uh i don't know if if you've uh seen any images of the canonical playmat in the wild but... didn't we play with that did we play with the playmat yeah. at the convention or was that just the other side was it the base game flipped over? Yeah, the, the canonical maps are on the back of the island. Yeah, no, we just play with it flipped over. I, I have seen a picture of the actual mat, though. If you have the play mat, there are... Some of the lands have additional token types which do not exist yet. Mm. And that is because, you know, Great Dinner Games didn't want to put those on the existing boards because they're like, you know, these don't exist yet. They might change. We don't want to. But I'm like, let's at least put them on the play mat because... Like, on, a, on the board, if you had a new token type and it really should be in a place, you can put a sticker on. But on a neoprene playmat, that just doesn't work. And we want to be able to keep them in sync. So let's do that. You know, it's canonical. I know where they will be, even if the details of what they are aren't hammered down yet. And if they're never published, then, you know, it's only for a few hundred people they'll, they'll understand. So, but, you know, those are obviously prime candidates. There will be more spirits, more power cards, more stuff in general. The design goal is that there will be some things which you can just use out of the box without needing to know anything about branch and claw but there will be other things which use the rules from branch and claw so it's sort of a branch and claw is recommended slash useful but not strictly required to have we're still figuring like you know my vague notion is like okay probably have like an appendix in the rule book for like here are the rules for branch and claw so, like, if there's more event cards, then, you know, that will teach you what you need to know about how to use them. But if you already have Branch and Claw, then you just know that. Yeah, mostly a more stuff expansion, you know, a few new effects, a few new things. Awesome stuff. Uh, <laughs> any Anything you can say about that? Any, can you hint uh, at any of the new spirits? Let's see. Greater Than Games doesn't... Because the problem is that anything can shift up to... Like, up until sure. Kickstarter happens and they say, it will be Spirit X. Then it can always change. Like So, uh, oh, one thing I can definitely say is also it will certainly include an additional... Or certainly is relative. Near certainly include two additional island boards and additional pieces. 
so that you know there are some many people don't care about five six player support but many people who do care about it care about it passionately it'll be there for them it'll be uh, the additional pieces will also be useful so if you're fighting high level england and you have serpent so you can't kill things quickly then you don't need to resort to using energy tokens to to make up for the extras the extra pieces are, <laughs> are, are still useful uh in contexts beyond five and six player games i'm, I'm playing around with it if i can get the rules hammered out for a rough difficulty increase for like have an extra board you know, just as a difficulty boost, mm. then that would all, uh, then I'd like to include that because that's also another way to make use of the new boards without uh, necessarily, you know, having a high player count. So that is almost certainly going to be in there. There's uh, there, there's going to be at least one new adversary. I, I'm certain of that. How many, I don't know. The exact number of spirits is still up in the air, but there will be multiple new spirits. What can I say about the new spirits? Uh, oh, here we go. Um, I can't specifically say what is going to be in there, but I can talk about things I've been working on. Some people have noted that in Branch and Claw, there's a spirit which deals heavily with beasts, and there's another spirit which deals uh, moderately with wilds. But there isn't one which deals with disease or with strife. Ah. Uh, And so there were designed two spirits which dealt with disease and strife, but the original Kickstarter did not get to the point where it was viable to include those in Branch and Claw. So those were sort of already designed. Now, one of them, it turned out, the, the, the original Spirit of Disease needed, it was overloaded. It had too much going on mechanically. It needed to get split out. And so two of the spirits I've been working on are a Spirit of Disease and the other half of that spirit, which got split out, which is uh, its own distinct thing. Uh, so those are sort of two strong candidates as possibility. And then the sort of strife-centric spirit is what it is gotten more iterations more evolution but it's still fundamentally the same concept uh, in terms of in terms of theme and it is a, also another very strong contender for being included so we'll pr- it is you know reasonably likely that those will crop up i think you know uh, that's about as speculative as i can get i think well i like to think that all these spirits are there on the island it's just yeah, yeah. a matter of which ones will decide to to oh, totally. wake up and be the exactly <laughs> yes. yeah yeah absolutely so. all i want in life is just more spirits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and like that's. Just, I just want a new spirit to show up at my door. Yeah. <laughs> once a week. The, uh, ring the doorbell. So, like the, the <laughs> I'd say that probably the number one request for expansion is more spirits. Like you know. Well, when I heard that there was just the promo spirit pack, yes. I'm like, yes, that's all I want. Yeah. Like I'm not ready for expansion stuff yet. I yes. want more rules. I just want more spirits. Yep. And, and my intent is that there will be some of the spirits which you can just, like, get the expansion, open the box, take them out of the box, leave the rest of the expansion in the box, and play them with the base game. Great. But, you know, I'd li- uh, I know there's... Again, it depends on which spirits end up in the mix, but, like, I'm really hoping to have at least one or two of those. The exact number, I don't know. And there's at least one or two spirits in development also, which they do have a cut one or two new rules which are specific to the expansion, but they don't make use of anything from Branch and Claw. So you go, okay, all right, like, uh, you know, all right, so this is a spirit. Well, you will need to read this expansion's rule book, but you don't need to read, know anything about Branch and Claw in order to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't need to, you know, play it with the event deck or whatever. And if it, and if you see a funny little paw print icon that's beasts, ignore it, you know. you know, uh, Like uh, Heart of the Wildfire mentions beasts, even though you might play it without the, the expansion. Sure. If so, that just doesn't do anything. You know, you're not pushing beasts because there aren't any there. You mentioned Kickstarter for this. Yes. Has, is there a time frame set at all? Uh, it's still tentative, but the tentative time frame is in October, kind of roughly over Essen. Okay. So it's I, I am excited. It's it's not a fast turnaround Kickstarter. It'll be a little while before delivery because art takes a long time. Sure. And they can't commission art until they know what spirits and power cards are going to be in it, and that requires a lot of playtesting. So mm-hmm. uh, the I can talk about the design process for spirits, which is I come up with a bazillion ideas. Uh, I narrow those down by going like, okay, these three ideas are too similar. I can only really do one of these. Flesh them out, start working with them. Of, you know, bazillion ideas, I get to like half a bazillion ideas, which actually can be translated into a reasonable form. We test those and some of them just don't work. So I either refactor them or start over with them or whatever. And then I eventually narrow it down to, okay, there's this smaller, you know, cluster. And I now have like uh, three fistfuls of spirits, which actually we're pretty sure will work. And then it's like, okay, given these, which of these should be in an expansion together? Like, you know, these two are a little close. This one would do better in a later expansion, maybe, you know, okay. And so there's this, it's kind of like, like I was talking about design, like start with a lot of stuff and go Mm -hmm. down. 
you know, this time, and originally I did this over five years. More recently, I've been doing, doing over over like six months is like try and go for a lot of different ideas and then contract, 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 because some ideas just prove untenable. Like some spirits are neat concepts and just don't work or don't work as initially conceived of and can take forever to get into a good place. And, you know, I don't want to be at a point where I'm still tinkering with a spirit a year after the Kickstarter ends because that way lies below deadlines. So how much of a like future roadmap expansions do you have in mind? Obviously, it sounds like you have a lot of concepts, but like so, Branch and Claws kind of there's a set of things that makes up that expansion. And it sounds yeah. like you at least have some reasonable idea of what the next expansion will be. Yeah. So that was actually part of I went to Greater Than Games headquarters in St. Louis before going to Geekway to the West back in May. And part of what we were doing was figuring out that, like sort of a vague, okay, like in your ideal universe, what sorts of things do you have ideas for what you might make? So there's the current expansion, which is sort of the more interesting things, uh, one or two, you know, one or two rules and effects, which are things I've like, I've wanted to include from the get go. The expansion, there's another expansion, which I've already talked about as an idea I've always wanted to do, which is a Dahan centric expansion, Hmm. which is, sort of more about them thematically and ideally would include the ability to play them as a, as a playable faction. Uh, I'd really love to do that because that sort of gives that both because like it gives them thematically, it gives them agency, like anything which isn't a player position in a co-op is ultimately an automata. It's, you know, it's being run by the game system and it would be nice to have the Dahan come to life. And that requires sort of the animating spirit of a person being them at the table. No pun intended. Also, you know, I, I've talked about there's um, right now all of the adversaries which exist are modeled off of colonization. Like we come in and we just overwhelm you with raw numbers of people here. And that isn't how all colonial problems went, historically speaking. Uh, there were cases like in Latin America, it was very frequent for the population of immigrants from Europe to be rather outnumbered by the locals but to take over just by force of arms and sort of subjugate either you know the ruling class or individual population centers or what and then sort of like carve them up into fiefdoms effectively and exploit the locals via threat of force to doing their work for them and that sort of conquest model is something which that's something I'd like to explore at some point in expansion if I can manage it. I have vague ideas for how it might work. There are entire ideas I have for exploring which would require a second color of invader pieces, which obviously, like, that's a non-trivial expense to, to, to print. And so, you know, if we ever get to that point, maybe that's something I'll explore where, you know, you can uh, uh, look at either, you know, factions warring over the island, like that would be kind of kind of nice, uh, or, or other things which you can do. So... I don't know exactly what will be out there. Like we have sort of vague concepts for like, oh, maybe this would be good. I know that I'd, like I would very much like a Dahan centric expansion to be sort of soon on the radar. I am gloriously pleased that Spirit Island is doing well enough to support expansions because A, it's a lot of fun to work on and B, there are all these ideas I have and they're cool and I want people to be able to, like, like I, going back to, to what I said earlier in the evening, like one of my primary drives has always been, I made a cool thing. Do you want to play with it? Um, and getting a chance to share cool things and have people enjoy them and play with them is a tremendous motivator for me. So, you know, having all these ideas lurking in the back of my head, I, 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 I am tremendously happy that I have the chance to get them out there. Yeah, and and it seems like you have such a rich lore and history, and you know you're talking earlier about the motivation of the Dahan is really complex. Like to me, it sounds like there's a lot of space for like other games in this world. Have you considered that kind of thing, or are you really just focusing on okay, what can I do with Spirit Island? I and the moment I'm just focusing on Spirit Island proper, other people have floated the idea, and I'm not opposed to the notion but it's also one of those i think i'll think about that another time right now yeah the plate is full. Um, ride the success yes. you know here yeah, yeah. I mean, like, if nothing else online of course there have been the calls for like legacy spirit island and uh, <laughs> of course exactly. i would play it I would. And, and, and like every game designer i know who when they you know first played a legacy game it's like oh there's an interesting new area of design which i hadn't considered i want to go play there like what could you do with this and I feel like it's still a field which is very 
uh, we're very much in the initial early exploration phases of like, you know, wow, what kind of stuff can you do here? This is neat. But A, Spirit Island would not translate well to a legacy game as it is because the arc which you undergo in a legacy game is incorporated into one game of Spirit Island. That, that small to large, the, the, the beleaguered to awesome, you know, win or lose, you are a titan. The way you talk about the spirits throughout the game is one of legacy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. Um, you know, the closest, the, there's sort of a little bit of that. that Branch and Claw has one scenario which allows you to play sort of a, a mini campaign of multiple games. And that's sort of about as close as I think you can get where it's like, you know, okay, the invaders come and then you beat them off. Great. And then you play different spirits because the old ones are too slow. Like the old ones are represented by you can take a single power card and when Invader Stage 3 hits, you get to play one power card for free from your pre previous game, which is basically, you know, your older, slow and mighty spirits going, got your back, wham! <laughs> um, but uh, that's about all they can manage on the timescales involved. But that's a really, like, that's, that's, that's what we see of Spirit Island Legacy right now. Uh, in order to make an actual legacy game set in this setting, it would really need to be something completely different mechanically like it would just, like you yeah. just need a totally different arc and probably different mechanical things you know we were talking in the the uh patron discord the other day because mm -hmm. i i have aspirations to design awesome. very light aspirations although okay sure. i'm actually going to try to get a design for the button shy contest but mm -hmm. they're like you should make a legacy game i'm like no i don't want to make a legacy game then i thought about it i'm like if i ever made a legacy game i would want to make it the most wild satirical legacy game ever like put in a strip of leather be like tear it in half <laughs> do it <laughs> you cannot progress until you tear this you strip of leather in half anagrams legacy oh, no <laughs> yeah the, uh, uh, i hate bananagrams <laughs> the uh the thing about legacy games is that they take like from all I am given to understand. I'm not, I'm not working on one right now because even though it is an intriguing concept, from all I understand, they take a lot more development time and my development time is fairly constrained because I'm also parenting. Oh, sure, so yeah. It's like, you know, that that is not what I need right now. Uh, I can't even imagine trying to design a legacy game. Uh, so, And also, the other thing is like, both for developing a given game and for improving your own skills as a game designer, iteration is key. And that's like... Uh, I feel like I got a lot better as a game designer and I'd recommend to other people like if you're looking to hone your skills make a game design it develop it iterate on it make it like the, the best game you think it can be for you at that moment but then put it away and move on to the next one like I, I know some people who have like their one design which they have spent 15 years on and I feel like you don't learn nearly as much from that as you do from just doing a thing doing a thing do a thing I've talked to people who learn uh in a somewhat non sequitur, the real life skill of pottery. And you learn a lot more from throwing 50 imperfect pots than you do from spending an entire afternoon obsessing over this one which you're making. You know, it's the same sort of thing. Like, you know, tr you know, to learn, just try new things, iterate new things. So, and doing that, I think, will be a lot harder with the legacy game where you need to first come up with like a balanced underpinning system and then layer a bunch of stuff on top of it. Well, and then every time you change something, yeah. it has implications for the whole campaign, exactly. probably. Yes. Yeah, so it's... Um, that's... Yeah, oh, that's you know, I've been there for other reasons, that being Spirit Island and some of its complexities, and it makes everything harder. Yeah. Well, this is a, even a more of a tangent, Excellent. but... Uh, oh, good. You See, we tell people when they come on the show, like... Go on tangents. That's fine. You can't have too many tangents. Yeah, yeah. You're the first person who's really gotten excited about it. So my normal, like, if I'm really excited about talking with people with things, I'll end up in just, like, stack-based conversational systems. Oh, yeah. And then you, like, pop it off, and then it's like, so that thing we were talking about seven layers ago, you know. You yes, know, it's I, the best. That's how I envision conversations with my fiance. Yeah, yeah, totally. She doesn't appreciate that so much. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it's interesting because, you know, you often hear, you talking about iteration. I believe you completely. Yeah. Like, that's... I'm sure that's how you get better at game design. But I'm thinking like, man, the, the things I've really practiced and gotten skilled at in my life are debate. Yep. And then when I was a kid, golf mm -hmm. throughout high school. In those two specific activities, that isn't necessarily true. In both debate and golf, you have to be very careful that you don't practice bad habits into yourself. Ah, yes. Which is a weird, because, yep. you know, obviously practice is good in any case, 
But in some cases, you have to be a lot more careful. I know in writing, they say, you, you know, if you're writing a novel, like write a bunch of bad chapters, like right. keep doing it, keep doing it, edit it, find out what's bad, yep. hone it out. But man, if you like go to the range in golf mm-hmm. and you think you've got a fix for your swing and it's not a fix when you then go have to fix that problem it's yes. like twice oh. as difficult oh, yeah. to get the muscle memory out of you yep. i don't know random so, thought there's no well interestingly a domain which may be halfway in between the two uh is martial arts mm. uh, i did a medium amount of shotokan karate when i was in high school and college and have more recently uh, started taking occasional uh, brazilian jiu-jitsu lessons and in both of those what you say about muscle memory is incredibly true. But in both of those instructors always say also to that starting off, like do it as well as you can, but don't obsess about perfection because right now, effectively, you aren't good enough to recognize the small details yet. Like you can't put it perfect in your muscle memory to start off with because you don't have the discrimination. You are still learning to learn and you are training up being aware of those muscles and giving those muscles, uh, you know, learning to put power to them without uh, opposing them at the same time and learning to, to just, you know, do it over and over and over. And then you need to go back and improve and refine. So you end up with this combination of, well, you just need to do a lot, but then you also need to do it right. So you end up sort of iterating on iteration in this case. Because mm-hmm. um, unlearning things is real pain in the butt <laughs> yeah well it's like I, I tell my debate students all the time like some of the best practice you can do is re-giving speeches and they never like to do it yep. but i was i was doing the round and this guy gave this one ar yep. and he did pretty good at it he's he he covered everything he needed to cover and i'm like okay tomorrow redo that and give yourself four minutes <laughs> like look over it get your flow in order how, how much are what how long are one ARs these days five Okay, all right. There were four when I did them. So. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, man. Was everything shorter? Uh, what were the constructors? It was, I think it was, yeah, it was eight 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 four 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 four. I believe. Oh, they shift the rebuttals to five, at least in the homeschool league. Yeah. Sorry, guys. You no, don't no, know what's going on. I understand. Yeah. That there have been shifts uh, since, I mean. I wow. Was, I was debating <laughs> in late 80s, so. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And it's like, no, go back, make sure your flow's on point. And really focus on your organizational structure and give yourself four minutes. You're going to be amazed at how efficient you can be on that. Just reiterating and honing and and, and seeing it again yes. helps so much. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Do, doing a one hour in four minutes is like tr- trying to fight 10,000 ninja. It's, 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 yeah. It's intense. Yeah. I I was the one A for a long time in high school. In the last couple of years, I switched switched over. The one A is a fun speech. Vegas is back up on top. 3-2. So... <laughs> Cool. All right. Yes. All right, <laughs> I so guess that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. We got to our debate talk in. Yes. You got your hockey talk. Okay. Oh, man. Perfect. Oh, I forgot this ask to, to ask this question from earlier. Yes. So I don't know where this started, but there was some controversial post on Board Game Geek okay. where someone got really, really, like, needlessly angry when someone else said that Spirit Island is a Euro game. So... I'm asking you. Oh, yeah. Okay. You saw was, that? Was that on Board I don't think it was Board Game Geek. I was think, it? I think it was another site because I actually monitor Board Game Geek. Uh, I don't think it was on the Spirit Island forums. Oh, maybe it was. I don't know. It was on someone's like blog on Board okay, Game yeah. Geek, I, I think. I caught uh, uh, reference to like, I think it was like Twitter or something. Every <laughs> once in, you know, basically on Board Game Geek, Reddit, and Twitter, I'll occasionally just, you know, do a, do a search. Like, sure. Do people have questions? Like, you know, what are people saying about my game? I, I've tried to tone it back because it turns out that when people are saying lots of nice things about your game, it gives you this little endorphin hit, which is kind of <laughs> addictive. So, you know, there, there was a period of time about for like the month after Spirit Island came out last summer where I did not get very much done. Uh, <laughs> just walk around. I'm, I'm the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also like a lot of, you know, questions coming up and adding those to the facts. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Asked again. But yeah, I caught on Twitter, like, you know, somebody talking with somebody else about it indirectly so i know that this happened but no just so summarize again for me the 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 argument what was it again it wasn't even an argument oh it was like some guy was i think he like wrote a review yeah 
And then there was a little discussion in the comments, yep. and he mentioned, you know, like, it's one of my favorite Euro games now, and then someone wrote some response and got really angry that they called it a Euro game. Yeah. Yep. But didn't make any argument. He's like, it's clearly not a Euro game. Right. And uh, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and so I, I think I, I just tweeted at one point, hashtag Spirit Island is a Euro game. <laughs> but, but I'm here to ask you now, yep. is Spirit Island a Euro game? I think Spirit Island does not fall neatly into the system of categorization which Euro is one bucket in. I think that... That's a very diplomatic answer. I, I, no, I think it's true. It's, it's, it obviously... I don't think 2018 Island, board gaming here. Yeah, I don't think that Spirit Island is unique in this. You're seeing a lot more games these days which take many elements from classic Euros but then omit other elements. And so some people will say, this is clearly a Euro because it includes X, Y, and Z. And other people will say, but it isn't because it doesn't have W, X, and Q. And they're kind of both right. And I would agree with that. Kind of yeah. like, but at the same time, it's also, I mean, it's not even like bookstores where mystery versus sci-fi is where you go look for it on the shelf. Like, I don't know of any game stores where they separate like the Euro games from the thematic games in like, you know, different shelving units. So... The labels are mostly for describing to other gamers to give them an idea for like, is it this sort of a game? In which case, I think has Euro elements is probably more accurate than is a Euro or isn't a Euro. And even more helpful is to explain like, which are those elements? Yeah. You know, so. Well, I actually have... It's almost got like a, a Euro core, but a lot of, like like the idea of having power cards and stuff. Yeah. You're kind of... You're, you're acting on that Euro core in a more Ameri. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Well, I, we had a friend of ours lives in Connecticut mm -hmm. and he comes over every other month, maybe for the weekend or something. Mm -hmm. And he wants to play the games he's been reading about. So he saw my review of Spirit Island and he's like, I really want to play Spirit Island, but mm -hmm. describe it like more than in the review. I don't quite get it. I'm like, and it took me a while. And I think I finally said, imagine if. Think of like a really heavy, like Terra Mystica level heavy, like Euro cooperative game and pretend it had a baby with Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and that's about where it is, I yep. think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Earlier you asked about like, how did I get into modern gaming? Something I skipped over because it wasn't directly relevant to my getting into gaming, but I did play Magic back when it first came out. Well, technically, I did not order any alpha, but I did. But I did own beta card. It was in that very, very early days, and I played it up through like Fallen Empires or so. So that was definitely something which has informed my game design. It was when Magic came out. I was delighted because whenever I had seen trading cards before, because some of my relatives did like you know baseball trading cards, I was like Magic. This is what I always wanted trading cards to be. Like I'd see picture of a baseball player with stats on the back. I'm like, great, how do we use this to play a game? And the answer is, no, it's just about a game. It's like, I don't want that. I want to be able to play with them. It's well, like, you can do, and then people would try and explain sort of like fantasy league-ish stuff to me. I'm like, that's not really what I'm looking for. I want to be able to like play this batter and get a hit. And so when Magic did that, it's like, yes, this is the way it should, you know, the stars have aligned, all is as it should be, excellent. This is what these cards were meant for. And you know, I've always had a soft spot for games which either modified their own rules or had a rich enough rule structure that you could tinker around with that. Um, well, and, and, you know, it's not the new, but it has the great benefit of just exporting a lot of the complexity into the cards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, so so Spirit Island has some magic baked into its DNA. Like, there's, there's areas where that clearly informed either my conscious thought process or my subconscious thought process about, like, you know, how things should work. Yeah, like, I don't play it anymore these days, and I'm not sure I'd want to, and it gets a bad rap, but yeah. one of the things I will say for Flux is that it is a glorious, self-contained, self-modifying rule system, which is an order of magnitude lighter than most others. Like, if you compare it to Cosmic Encounter or Magic the Gathering, and it got me intrigued at that at a much younger age. Like, oh, hey, you can do things which are fundamentally sort of recursive in this way, where it's like, okay, like, you know, this is, this is modifying itself. You get weird self-variance 
because you know you may always go through the same deck but your end state at the end of the deck is going to be very different depending on rules now as it turns out not so much because they're all kind of varying the same levers but on first blush it looked like whoa there's a lot more possibility than you would seem from like 60 cards you know that was uh like these days I, I play virtually no Looney Labs games, but Andy Looney did so many things which helped me as a younger game designer that he did multiple essays on how like, you know, if you, you know, so you're thinking about self-publishing, here's what you need to know. So you're thinking about designing games, here's 10 pieces of advice, nine of which I agree with like hands down, the 10th of which I'm like, that is great for you and not for me. <laughs> um, but that's because of his playing preferences. And you know, that's because he likes games which are different sorts of games than I like. But nonetheless, he really helped me a long time ago. And I'm, I'm very grateful, even though I no longer play anything written by him. It's hard. Now, it's crazy to think about the, the influence that Magic has had. Yeah. It's insane. Like, I don't really play Magic. Like, every once in a while, super casually. Yep. I just don't like CCG. I don't want to spend my money on that. Yeah. Uh, I, play, I play Netrunner instead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I was which I think is a better game. And I know... Okay, 15 bucks a month, that's it. Yeah. Great. <laughs> that's all I need to spend. I have everything. I was really fond of Netru Netrunner back when it came out. I, I was really excited to see the, the reboot. That was neat. Netrunner is, I think, has the best meta it's had since I started playing right now. Oh, nice. I have it, not. So I, I have the, the base game, but mm -hmm. I do just don't get enough two-player gaming in to have followed up on it, which is a bit of a pity. But they just They just did the first card rotation. Okay. So they removed the first two cycles okay. and did a second ba uh, second core set yep. to modify some of the balance stuff, and it's it's really nice. Anyway, it, you're right. It does have some some Euro elements, but it's not obviously not entirely Euro. But that's kind of the cool thing about games now yeah. is that they're all hybrids, yeah, it's, pretty much. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, looking at the shelf over here, like we got some games that are clearly like Ameritrash, like Descent. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, most of these games are some kind of hybrid. Look at, I mean, even like Kemet, like that's got, that's got like action selection. Yeah, and, we just, uh, combination of, you know, people building on what's come before and just making better and better games, innovating on, on long paths that other people have opened up doors to. Lots of, you know, so many games coming out, lots of people experimenting, trying new things or variations on old things. And also the just with the growing market, like so many more people are playing games. One of the things about Spirit Island, like I always knew there would be some people who loved it. That was obvious from the playtesting that there were that some people would just fall in love with it and and want to play it a lot and evangelize it to their friends. Mm -hmm. But it was unclear how big that market would be because at the time most of the co-ops out were pretty light, and there was sort of the perception of well, co-op gaming is sort of more a light social experience. Uh, one of the reasons I made Spirit Island was because I was looking for something which served my preferences, which are for a heavier, more thinky game, but also a co-op. In the time that it took Spirit Island to be designed and developed and published and printed and get to the U.S., I feel like the number of people who wanted what I want grew by a lot. Uh, yeah. Partly because just more people are playing games, but also partly because... You know, there were people who, when I started the design on Spirit Island, may have just gotten into board games. And if they played Spirit Island then, they would have been like, this is a little much for me. Mm -hmm. But now they've been playing games for, you know, three, four, five, six, seven years. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is no problem. Yeah. No, that's that's how exactly it came to us. And then I was like, wow, I, you know, when I heard, oh, it's a, it's a heavy co-op. I'm like, great. I love co-ops. I love heavy games. And then, we, you know, we played a few times like, oh, I really wanted this game and didn't know it. <laughs> Like, this is the kind of game I wanted. Yeah. And then, you know, honestly, I think in terms of like, you know, we talk about board gaming history. It's not that much time that modern board games have been yeah. around. But I think 2017 is going to be, you know, we look back in 10, 15, 20 years. I think it's going to look pretty significant in terms of heavy co-op games. Oh, yeah. Because we got Spirit Island. Yep. We got Gloomhaven. Yep. I haven't played it, but Seventh Continent is getting a lot of, you know, good reviews. And these have like dropped like, you know, an anvil to me at least, because it's like, wow, these are, this is kind of the experience I really have been craving. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we get a, some amazing ones. I did have another question yeah. and I'm not Go ahead. entirely sure how to ask this, but we talked earlier about how Spirit Island kind of turns the colonialism story on its head and mm -hmm. you're playing the other side of that. And well, one other side of it. One other side of it. Yeah. Sure. And is that sort of thing something 
you look for in game design or something you would want to see more of because obviously you know this is one case uh Mm -hmm. we've played archipelago which is Mm -hmm. obviously kind of the other side perhaps i don't know about that i think archipelago is pretty self-aware of what it's doing Oh, I, I'm not trying to yeah. criticize it. It's just in the sense of you're playing the the. People oh, coming in, in terms of agency, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, it is something I would love to see more of in game design. It's something I, you know, it's not it's not something you'll see in every single design of mine. I have a you know, like you know, Fealty didn't have it. It's a pretty standard fantasy ish feel. Uh, the next game I have coming out is uh, you know nothing to do with that either. It's something I I might explore more. I would love to see the board game industry as a whole explore that more. There is the question raised of, you know, if you're trying to make a board game which represents the experiences of the colonized, like the best person to do that is somebody from that culture which was colonized, which is not me and is not a lot of people in the board game industry, which tends, at least in the US, to trend very strongly white and very strongly sort of European heritage you know, more the invaders than the, uh, the than the locals. So h- how does that come about? I don't know. And I feel like there's definitely a space for people, you know, like me to make games which at least touch on those issues. And part of the reason I made, I, I made the game was it was as a reaction to all of what is there. I feel like, you know, sort of hanging a hat on like, you know, here, see, you know, the, the like, you know, go out and colonize new lands is done all the time. And why don't we see any of the flip side of that? Like this... This theme has downsides, and some games like Archipelago are very self-aware of that, and others just aren't. Uh, and... Yeah, like we were just talking the other day, we played Mombasa oh, yeah. for the first time, yeah. and I thought, like, mechanically, it's a great game, I thought. Yes. But then, I, man, I'm looking at the game, I'm like, really? Yep. That's that's it's, the theme you're going to do? It's, it's look, <laughs> do you, in the beginning of the rulebook, like he says, like, what I like is that the start of the rulebook, the designer... Um, I didn't... I learned from someone else. I didn't read the rulebook. So like the first paragraph in the rulebook is the designers being upfront about, like, you know, this is representing some terrible times in African history. You know, the, the designer apparently grew up in Africa. And so it's like, here are some resources where you can read about that. That, I think, is awesome. But then the second paragraph goes on and says, this game takes place in sort of an alternate universe, Africa, where it's not that. And there, I feel like... I feel like if you want that fig leaf to hold up, you need to really go with the alternate universe thing. Like, if it had been a map of Africa, except clearly not Africa, like, differently shaped and with the names being different, then I can go, yes, this is an alternate universe. I can buy into this. Uh, I I can feel like I'm playing in a different reality and not feel like I'm just reenacting atrocities. But... Just saying that in the rules with no experience, not even mechanical support, but experiential support. Uh, Support for the experience of playing something which is alternate reality, which is different, which isn't exactly as it was. Without that, to me, just felt like I was replaying a particularly brutal part of history. So despite the fact that I love the mechanics and think it's a a really neat design, uh, I have not revisited it. What I really am liking that I've been seeing in the past few months, or as I get more into kind of the current news cycle of games is games that actually have a point of view on something. Mm. Like I know a lot of people will be obviously mean, spirit Island. Yeah. Anti-colonialism, whatever me. I'm like, great. It's trying to say something. Yeah. It's trying to do something. Absolutely. Like I picked up this little solo game called anxiety based on a Reddit post. Oh yeah. Did you see that Reddit post? Uh, I don't think so, but I think I've heard of the game. Yes. The guy just posted, he said, hey, I've been struggling with anxiety. I decided as a therapeutic exercise, you know, I've heard that you should, you know, try to do creative things. Yep. So my thing's board games. Yeah. I want to make a card game about it. Yeah. And I'm like, great. So I've ordered a copy mm-hmm. and I, I, I reviewed it the other day and I'm, I'm going to post an interview tomorrow. People hearing this in the podcast, it's already up with the guy about it. And it's a decent game. It's pretty good. But I just love the idea. Like. Yeah. Let's try to simulate the experience of anxiety. Like, let's see what games can do about it. I heard there was a big, what was the big con that just happened super, like, last week? I don't remember. There's some, I, I'm really bad at keeping up with board game news. <laughs> it's my job, but, like, I'm bad at it. There's a game coming out about, like, where the player, it's like a cooperative game, and you're all elderly care nurses. And oh, you're, life of yeah. Yeah, so, and you're trying yeah. to, like, 
take care of this guy and then learn his history. Yeah. That stuff's awesome. Mm-hmm. Like maybe the I mean maybe it's a bad game. Maybe it's not going to work out. But I love to see that like publishers are publishing things that are trying to say something to have a perspective mm-hmm. and try to provide a narrative and a setting that's interesting. Yep. And at least like you know maybe some people get angry at that and maybe it's controversial. But I just want to see it happen. And and part of that part of my appeal in you'll notice the GMT shelves over here and yes. war games and stuff is that they do that. Like it's, it's a lot of history nerds, yeah. right? And I'm not a history nerd, but I like seeing, Oh wow. They're interpreting the conflict this way. Or like in, in labyrinth, like you're playing like Islamic jihadist on one side, which can be, you know, some people may might not want to do that, but it's interesting to kind of say, okay, let's look at the conflict and look at the, the political realities of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff. I think board games can have such potential to do that very, very well. And that's what I'm getting excited about nowadays. Yeah, we're in a cool cool spot right now where, I mean, even just thinking about this simply, the convergence of the uh, Marriage Trash and the Euro games, we have, we have games that have such rich mechanics that can, I don't know, simulate something interesting. And we have theme more richly integrated into that. I think we're at an interesting place where where games can 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 try to to say something and kind of have the the ability to say something along the lines of what you're getting at. Yeah, like it, a, we talk a cool place. We talk all at. the time on this podcast that to me a game is thematic when the theme it, not when it has a vivid theme, mm-hmm. but when the theme and the mechanisms are integrated. Mm-hmm. And I think we're seeing that more and more, and it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And Spirit Island is one of them. Good job. <laughs> We've kind of touched on this, but just kind of the idea of board gaming as a medium to express a message or an experience or something mm, yes. um, is pretty interesting. And I, some of uh, one friend in particular, or one or two of our friends from college, has written extensively about this in video gaming and mm-hmm. how the idea of some games, some of the better games, I think they talk about Bioshock a lot of this, mm-hmm like telling a story and giving you this experience or exploring a topic or something gives a game a much more richer foundation and also makes it more impactful Mm -hmm. uh, like socially and that video gaming or you know maybe for our purposes board gaming can kind of be a, a medium to express that yeah yeah absolutely i think that things can be done on sort of a uh an experience and learning artistic explorative like there's all kinds of levels that neat things can be done Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's an it seems like a pretty good stopping point this might be our longest podcast ever it felt like it flew by though so thanks for coming by that's our podcast for today i hope you had a good time i had a great time great uh, don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Check out thethoughtfulgamer.com for all kinds of reviews, including a glowing review of Spirit Island if you needed any more reason after listening to this to play this game if you haven't already. I know our patrons, I think, unanimously happen to all be fans of Spirit Island also, which is great. We talk about it all the time. Check me out on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. Oh, yeah, if you want to be a patron and uh, talk about how great Spirit Island is or, you know, other things. We talk about Gloomhaven sometimes or random topics. Really all of the board games, actually. All of them, yeah. Even Bananagram sometimes, to my dismay. Because it dismays you. And if you want to watch these podcasts live and get all kinds of other cool rewards, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.